bop, bow, bow, wow, 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 hi, hello, welcome, everybody, gather around Wolfden Podcast, and go, hey, hi, how you doing, it's time, we're here, uh, how are you? Surprisingly hungry, I literally just ate dinner. And I could eat something right now. You want a, you want an apple cider donut? Is it a Stu Leonard's apple cider donut? Where is it? Where because is, I've had like no, three of those this week. It's not. It's uh where, Stop and Shop? Stop and Shop. Okay. You want you want an apple cider donut? You want a kind bar? Mm. Or cookies. Chocolate chip cookies. Pillsbury. Or all of them. <laughs> I will never say no to chocolate chip cookies. Okay. We are in the middle of the show. Do you, I'm you gonna, okay? I'm gonna get, I'll get the cookies. Okay. I'm not gonna make them. No, I, 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 I already was made gonna say them. you were gonna make them. I already made them. All right. Hey, everybody. How you doing? This is just an excuse to get me to take over the show. How's everybody doing tonight? Who wants to talk about dumb shit? <laughs> Forget about video games. I oh, put, he's back. I put him in a little hole. Oh, ooh, spooky season. Spooky. I made myself a coffee. I got this yeah. good coffee from Trade. Yeah. That's not sponsored this podcast. Uh, Ooh, it's all cool. fruity. Smell this coffee. Hold on. You can even have a sip of it if you want. I'll smell the fruit. You're you're <laughs> you're a fruit. <laughs> no. In my defense, my nose has never really worked properly. So okay, get this away from me. Put gonna... it right there. We got to make room now. We we're we're this was a horrible mistake. Uh, hi, guys. Wolf Den Podcast time. We got a lot of things to talk yeah. about. The title of the show is that Nintendo acknowledged the, the next Switch because Doug Bowser actually answered a question about it. Yes. Believe it or not. Usually doesn't do that. He usually says, I'm not going to. Actually, he did say, I'm not going to answer that. And then he answered he it. He doesn't just say, I'm not going to answer it. He finds the most elaborate way to dance around yeah. the question. It's really an art. It is. It, it is an art to be a CEO mm -hmm. like that. Uh, but he he we got closer than we've ever gotten to to yes. acknowledgement of another console. Uh, what else do we got to talk about? Uh, what do we got? This wasn't a big week for news because everybody was talking about uh, either Spider Man Two or Super Mario Brothers Wonder, which we will, which we are also going to be talk talking about. about. Yes. Um, I have played Spider Man. I have not played Mario Wonder. And I've played Mario Wonder. I have not played Spider Man. Okay, what there a we perfect go. combination. I actually have Spider Man. Right. Uh, I haven't even downloaded it. It's it's sitting, yeah, waiting for my PlayStation to turn on. <laughs> uh, so we'll talk about that. We uh, know what the best selling game of last month was, and it's pretty surprising. Uh, we have more news on uh, Kong, the Kong Skull Island game that's been taking the internet by storm. We know oh, yeah. why it's a piece of shit. We know why it's a piece of shit? Yeah. Okay, all right. So we can get into that. It's not a surprise why it's a piece of shit. Okay. Um, the Metal Gear Solid collection comes out tomorrow, I think. Okay. There's already some controversy. I mean, there's been controversy around it. Um, there's new controversy around it, but we're going to touch on one in particular. So. I, I know of that, but also I saw uh, Kit, what's his name, Ellis? <laughs> Kit from Kit and Krista. Yeah. He posted um, uh, a picture of his like home screen, his Switch mm -hmm. home screen, and it had all of the Metal Gear games. Uh, individually? Yeah, why do they come individually? So I think that's only on the Switch. Okay. Do they come individually? That's weird. Because I don't like that. What part of the controversy, this is not what we were going to discuss, okay. but we'll, might as well discuss it now. On the Switch, at least, on the cartridge, yeah, it's only Metal Gear, Metal Gear Two, NES Metal Gear, and uh, Snake's Revenge. It's one of those. Those are the only four games on the cartridge. M MGS One, Two, and Three, you have to download. And I think on Switch, they made it individual games. Yeah, because he even had the MSX game as yeah. like a separate yeah. game. That's I don't like yeah, that. So it's it's a really bizarre situation on Switch. Yeah. Some people like some people like having the games broken out. I don't I, that part I don't mind. It's and I don't necessarily mind the fact that not everything's on cartridge because a lot of games do that. Right. But I think more and more as we see people are getting nervous about like, you know, digital distribution and games getting pulled and Konami not having the best track record, seeing it done like that like really doesn't, you know, it really doesn't instill confidence in people that this game was done well. I know some people are into like you know how, how I have uh, 
emulated stuff on Steam Deck. Like yeah. I have on my whole emulation library. Uh, some people are into taking all of those games and making them individual games in your Steam account. Right. And that is just too much. Yeah. I'd rather have like all my Steam games emulation. Yeah. You know, I don't want them all to be mm-hmm. uh, also their too, own games. Because of, uh, the the main reason you're buying the games, MGS 1, 2, and 3, because they're digital download, um, the game the whole game as a whole now requires 32 gigs of storage. So if you don't oh. have an SD card in your switch, yeah, go get one or, or play one game at a yeah. time. Uh, that, this is a good uh, candidate for folders on the switch. Yes. This is why there should be yeah. folders on the switch. I mean, there is, but not the good kinds. No. It's not on the home screen. Oh yeah. Yeah. You can like, yeah, yeah it's some bullshit. Uh, anyway, uh, we have to thank some people like Forgotten Scars. Thanks for the five months. DJ Skeletor. Thanks for the hundred bits. Uh, Scatterbrain. Thank you for the twenty-eight months. Teardrop Tone. Thank you for the nineteen months. DJ Skeletor. Thanks for subscribing. Oh, bits and subscribe. Okay, Masaki. Thank you for the two months. And Fadud Dud. Thank you for the twenty-three months. All right. Anyway. Uh, let's just let's just jump into it with Dive the right Doug in. Bowser okay. interview f- with Inverse. Yes, uh, video game consoles come and go, but the Switch is forever. At least that's how it seems. Sometimes, six years after it launched, the beloved handheld hybrid is still going strong and on track to sell 15 million devices in 2023. But for Nintendo of America president Doug Bowser, who didn't uh, take a picture with me at E3 one year, just want everyone to know that, uh, the reason behind the Switch's lasting power is simple. It's the games. It's still a very unique gaming platform, Bowser tells Inverse. And then on top of that is the games, the set, the steady drumbeat of content, whether it's our own first party games or whether it's games that are brought to us by our publishing partners, being a small, quite honestly, it's, it's allowed us to keep players engaged. But even with the count, the continued success of the console, Nintendo fans are buzz with rumors and reports of a successor to the Switch maybe around the corner. Bowser won't comment on the rumors swirling around a Switch 2, but he does point to the Nintendo account platform as a long-term strategy for whenever the company does decide to launch a new console. In the past, every device we transitioned to had a whole new account system, uh, he hints. Nintendo account will allow us to communicate to our players if and when we make a transition to a new platform to help ease the process of, uh, or transition. Uh, just ahead of the release of yet another excellent Switch game, Super Mario Bros. Wonder, Bowser, Bowser sat down with Inverse to talk about everything from the new Mario game to why Nintendo employees don't have a union. Oh, I'm sure that's a good oh, reason. Oh, <laughs> I, I need to hear that. <laughs> I would love to hear Doug Bowser's answer for that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Producer Takeshi, uh, Takeshi Tezuka recently said Mario Wonder wasn't developed with a deadline in mind until much later in development. In an industry famous for crunch, how do you think the development team's approach affected the final product of Super Mario Brothers Wonder? Uh, I've always caref- I've, I'm always careful not to comment on the part of the developers, but in general, what Mr. Tezuka noted was that early on in the development cycle, he really did want to give the team the freedom to explore a variety of ideas. The result was a lot of unique and creative ideas uh, they could uh, they could think about without the pressure of a, re- of a deadline or the pressure of, how do I actually bring this to life? Uh, one thing with Nintendo development is we don't pressure our teams to deliver within a certain window. If they need more time, they'll take more time. The reason for that is our players have an expectation of quality um, that our games will bring. We want to make sure we respect that and deliver those wow moments. Um, that's good. More companies should do that. I think of uh, Cyberpunk and how they had a hard deadline and they didn't figure out what the game was going to be until like a month before that deadline and then they released it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking like uh, if you don't have a deadline for for a big project like this, how are you ever going to get it done? Yeah, because that's a double-edged sword because Duke Nukem Forever didn't have a deadline. And when that came out 15 years later, after 15 years yeah. of development, it stunk. Yeah. So I mean, you but but the Nintendo knows yeah how to make something so that you don't fart it out yeah. at the end half finished. You know. Uh, yeah, that's like the difference between like you know people who take their craft seriously mm-hmm. and like want to take their time and fully develop their idea as opposed to like a bunch of hot chats who are like, hey. Let's just do what we want. We got yeah. money to burn. Boom. Yeah. So 
they, I, I think Mario Wonder has been a testament to their their level of of, of polish and making something yes. re- something really nice. It's a nice change of pace from the last couple of Mario games. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nintendo has had some duds on the Switch. Yeah. Uh, but none of them would be technically broken. Like in the same way that like Pokemon was. Right. Pokemon is the most technically broken rushed thing that Nintendo has involvement with. Yeah. But, you know, but it's the not things, really their fault. Like a bad Nintendo, like at least this generation, a bad Nintendo game would be the equivalent of like you know, a good EA game, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. like they're that much ahead of what everybody else is doing. So, uh, when Mario wonder was coming out, people were tweeting about how Nintendo had such a great year and all the, 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 uh, meta scores for all of their triple, uh, all of their first party games. Yeah. And the worst ones were, I think Xenoblade maybe, Okay. which is pretty, still pretty good. Yeah. And also, Everybody won to switch, mm. which uh, scored very poorly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's like barely a game, though. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So anyway. uh, Mario Wonder is the first 2D platformer in the series in over a decade, receiving widespread acclaim. Uh, this return to Roots approach has also worked with Metroid Dread. Is this something that Nintendo would consider doing with franchises like Zelda? Bowser responds, I think what's important is that the development teams have the opportunity to really understand what they want to build and the type of game they want to create. Whether that's a reinvention of a classic game or going in a whole new direction, we really want to give our dev teams a lot of leeway to decide where they want to go with the future uh, game development. It, it's it's hard for other IPs to adopt this sort of mentality because uh, Mario has... I mean, it's known for the 2D stuff. Yeah. Metroid also is known for the 2D stuff. Um, what else do they got? Well, I think with Zelda in particular, it was easier of like a few years ago to distinguish. You could do a 2D Zelda and a 3D Zelda because the 2D Zeldas were always on the handheld. Yeah. Or, you know? or top down. Or yeah, yeah. Yeah. The top down ones like Minish Cap yeah. was on GBA, but like Wind Waker was on GameCube or even like A Link Between Worlds was, a, was 3D, but it was top down like a link to the past that was on 3ds so that's where my mind went my mind yeah. immediately went uh uh the, the the dream one what the hell is it called the, the, the link's awakening link's awakening yeah. my mind immediately went to link's awakening right. but i guess that's a remake yeah that's a that's a remake i don't yeah. know i don't know if we're gonna see like a new top-down zelda anytime soon i think it's i didn't think about that yeah. and i think that's possible i think that's a possibility yeah. for, for for them to, to i mean Unless they just remake one of the older ones again, but yeah. I don't. I I think there's opportunity for some for a Mario Wonder type thing with Zelda. Oh yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, f- as Nintendo prepares to open a museum, how does the company plan to prioritize preservation of its history and games for a global audience? Uh, we really do consider ourselves to be more of an entertainment company than just a dedicated video game company. Video games are skip, skip that one. Skip. We don't, okay, we don't, okay, okay. We don't care about the okay. fucking museum. But I think. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I do want to go to the museum. Right. I do want to go to the museum, but for for the sake of uh, staying on topic here, I just want to see if he says because like the idea of like preserving history, mm-hmm. that's you know what everybody says. You know when it talks about like games being lost to time, games being pulled, why emulation is so prevalent. You know the idea of preserving these games, and Nintendo has notoriously in the past been kind of against it. So I fully support preserving stuff like the golf war game yeah. boy like the uh like the e3 uh statue of zelda yeah. uh, Mar- uh, what was his name link yeah <laughs> like yeah, that boy sh- zelda. like that stuff but uh when you talk about games preservation we're always talking about the games and yeah there's gonna they don't give a shit about that well he says today we give our fans a way to play our games through switch online um so that's uh so that's the way we are allowing our fans to engage with our content. They may remember from way back when uh, they started playing video games. So he acknowledges that you know Switch Online is an avenue is our avenue to play classic mm-hmm. games, but that's all he's saying. I, I feel like Nintendo could do more than just offer a subscription service. I think Switch Online gets a lot of flack, mm-hmm. but I think it is a great service, at least in terms of playing retro games. Yeah. 
uh, obviously could be a lot better. Yeah. And Nintendo could do a lot more to let those games be accessible. Yeah. But I think that it's pretty good where it is. I think for Nintendo games, it's good. Mm-hmm. I think as a representative of the entire system or systems yeah. that it's representing, I think it leaves a lot to be desired. Yeah. And that's not entirely Nintendo's fault. Right. You know, because they have to, there's yeah, license no, they holders, there's third party license yeah. holders. It's no. their fault that their stuff isn't accessible. Like Konami, like yeah. they, they made their stuff accessible. Capcom's mm. making their stuff accessible. Yeah. They're doing good stuff, but they can't do everything. Yeah. You know? uh, leaks from the FTC uh, versus Microsoft trial revealed that Microsoft had discussed about acquiring Nintendo. I'm not really asking you about why that would or wouldn't happen, but more broadly, what do you think about uh, the growing trend of acquisitions and what its effect on the industry has been and will continue to be going forward. We have a great relationship with Microsoft. We consider them uh, to be partners in many, many ways. And you only have to look at uh, Nintendo Switch to see that partnership. Obviously, Minecraft is on Switch. And we brought Brand- Banjo-Kazooie to Smash Brothers Ultimate. So we're looking forward to that partnership continuing. That's all they've done. Yeah. <laughs> is put Banjo on the Switch. Hey, hey. The Ori games are on Switch true Ooh. i thought about that because i want to break out my microsoft surface pro remember that thing? yes i want to i remember i played ori on that on that yeah oh wow way back yeah. i played ori on that it ran like dog shit but yeah. it ran yeah so i kind of want to break that thing out again see if i can put controllers on the side what's what are the it's the two ori games cuphead Oh, the Cuphead's now on PlayStation, so that doesn't really count. You're talking about first-party games that are now Microsoft games that are on Switch. It's the two Ori games. It's Minecraft. Is there one more? Cuphead, but that... Cuphead, but yeah. Barely counts. Yeah. I feel like there's got to be one more. Banjo is on Switch Online. Banjo is on Switch Online. The Rare rare Replay? Rare Replay is not on Switch. Okay. Yeah. Doom. (laughs) Doom. (laughs) I guess that counts too now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. not much. Yeah. Uh, he continues, as far as consolidation in the industry goes, I've been a part of the industry for 16 plus years now. One thing that's been constant is the acquisition of studios, but the other constant is the fact that new studios are popping up every single year. Incredibly creative studios are uh, making content from indie size to AAA size, so as consolidation happens on an equal basis, we're seeing these new studios, which really uh, just speaks to the dynamic nature of the industry overall. In the end, that bodes well for players. Now, he's not wrong in the sense that, yes, new studios are popping up every day, indie studios, even like uh, bigger budget studios making like big games. However, I think he's missing a certain aspect of it where when more and more uh, studios own more and more, it makes it harder for the little guys to come up and get their foot in the door, so to speak. The retro future's in the chat, and I oh, just... Hey. I just <laughs> showed on my screen accidentally me making sure that I'm following him on Twitter. <laughs> Twitch. <laughs> Whoopsies. Uh, good times. Um, anyway, I think that uh, indie games have been getting more and more popular, and mm. have and have the, the gap between AAA games and indie games has been closing over the last couple of years yeah so um it's now more than ever trip uh indie games have a big fighting chance mm-hmm. and and they are proof that you don't need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to make a big return yeah you know i i also think that uh a lot of triple a games still for years they've felt the same yeah they all follow the same couple of formulas mm-hmm and indie games are the ones that are really innovating. Yes. And uh I still I still feel that. It seems like it's getting worse and worse. Yeah. Uh you know, I hate comparing games to movies, but it's very similar in that industry where you know, the the big budget movies are all the same whereas, you know, the smaller indie stuff is where like really interesting things are happening. Mm-hmm. You know, just look at what has happened to horror in the last decade or so. Um but that said, at a certain at a, at a certain angle, you do still kind of need the bigger budget games, the triple A games, the big blockbuster movies, because those I don't want to say they set the standard for the industry, but 
that's what people wind up thinking of when they think of video games. They think mm-hmm. of the big budget AAA stuff. And if every year that's the same Call of Duty game or every year that's the same Madden game, um, even if it's the same like Mario game, like you, that's a bad look. You, yeah. You, why continue? Which they've done. Yeah, they yeah. did exactly that. Yeah. Why continue to buy the shit if it's just going to be the same thing over and over again? Yeah. No, I... I... I agree. I, I I think there's a place for AAA games. I think AAA games are are falling into the same problem that big budget movies are falling into, yeah. where they spend a lot of money for no reason. Yeah, like yeah, uh, yeah. like you don't need all, like you can make the movie with so much less shit these days. You yeah. don't need all of that shit. You don't yeah. need a forty thousand dollar camera. Yeah, you know you can get the same look with a fourth of the price. Yeah. You know, like. Same thing with video games. You don't yeah. need uh, all that yeah. development time. You know, mm-hmm. not time. You need the time. You need the time. <laughs> not everything needs to look like Avatar. Yes, you know? exactly, exactly. Not everything needs to take the most use of a forty ninety. Yeah, you know. Okay. All right. Now here we go. This is what you. This is what you all clicked right. for. The Switch has a very had a very long lifespan for a console. Other consoles on the market continue to push graphical fidelity. Uh, though as technology improves, that pursuit has diminishing returns. Do you think Nintendo's method of having more distinctive art styles is a better approach as enhanced graphics become less and less possible? I play on all the platforms and I enjoy the content that everyone is creating. We've always said at Nintendo, what's most important to us is not so much what's inside the machine or the device, but what happens on the screen when you put the hand when you put your hands on the controllers and start engaging in the gameplay experience. Does it draw you in? Is it immersive? Uh, to that point, you can use a variety of different art styles, some with higher fidelity, uh, some with perhaps a different, more cartoonish uh, type style. There's a host of different styles overall on the platform, and I do think that's what separates us a bit uh, outside of the obvious visual differentiation with the Nintendo Switch's form factor and helped us to lengthen that longevity. Uh, the one thing I like to say is consumers are the ones who are voting right now and we're scheduled to sell about 15 million units this year alone oh. that's uh it's that diversity of content that's really bringing players in and keeping them on the platform uh there have been reports that nintendo showed off a successor to the switch behind closed doors during gamescom as we have discussed the switch has had a long lifespan and continue and a huge install base how when you consider the idea of a successor to the switch do you think helping do you think about helping those people who are on the console transfer to the next platform while reassuring them that the content and investment in the switch will somehow transfer to its successor? Bowser's response. Wait, before you uh, let me bury the lead a little bit. Okay. He said that the switch is scheduled to sell 15 million units this year alone. So I looked it up mm-hmm. uh, cause I wanted to see where that would put it. Cause they're very close to hitting uh best selling console yeah. of all time. What is, what would that be? 150 million? I think 150, yeah. Yeah, so they're... uh, Oh, yeah, as of, uh, I think, June, they were at like 130. So they need 20 million more. Yeah. So that's very, very very, very close. I don't think they're going to keep the Switch on the market just to hit that number. (laughs) No, but... He's talking about how I mean he brings up what what we always bring up how this, yeah. the Nintendo uh, is very good at stylizing their games so that graphics don't matter too much. Yeah, uh, so that that makes a lot of sense. All right, you may okay give the people what they want. Well, first I can't comment or I won't comment. I should say on the rumors that are that are out there. But one thing we've done with Switch uh, to help with that communication and transition is the formation of the Nintendo account. In the past, every device uh, we transitioned to had a whole new account system. Creating the Nintendo account will allow us to communicate with our players if and when we make the transition to a new platform to help ease the process or transition. Our goal is to minimize the dip you typically see in the last year of one cycle and the beginning of another. I can't speak to the possibility, I can't speak to the possible features of a new platform. But the Nintendo account is a strong basis for having that communication as we make the transition. So once again, we're hearing the top brass at Nintendo talking about how the next Switch will have a unified account system yes. of some kind. I think and that they're fo- it seems like they're focusing really hard. Well, on I that. think they need to remind people that this is going to happen because like he said, 
every Nintendo system has been a clean break. You know, nothing really transitions from one to the next. There's backwards compatibility, but even that's like limited in some aspects. Mm. Um, and Nintendo has historically shown they don't know what they're doing with online. They're very bad at it. So I think even if it's just like leaks and, you know, rumors and like from uh, stockholder meetings and stuff, we get that information that the account system is going to carry over. I think that's important that that information gets out there to let people know that, yes, Nintendo is aware of their history of being bad transitioning yeah. from one system to the next. And they've seen the way other devices are doing it. They're going to follow that trend and try to make it as smooth as possible. I think it will still be fucked in some <laughs> in some way. Right. Something's going to it's going to be almost good. Yeah. And something's going to be not well, cool. If you think about it from the PS3 to the PS4, mm -hmm. your PlayStation account carried over, but none of your purchases did because there's a whole yeah. new system. Yeah. So it's very it's, well. PS4 to 5? No, PS3 to 4. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that, that was fucked. Yeah, same thing with Xbox 360 to Xbox One initially. So yeah. it's very possible that, like, yes, your account carries over and it's... You they know, has retroactively all... fix that Xbox. Yes. Yeah. To a point. You know, still yeah. not every game is backwards compatible. But my point is, it's very possible Nintendo, yes, your account carries over and, like, your history carries over, but the games aren't necessarily going to carry over. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's still being left off the table right now one of the reasons i wanted an xbox one so bad was because i wanted my gamer score to still be there yeah <laughs> but but then all but my like, friends no, got playstations yeah, like, they really fucked up the announcement of the xbox one so i had yeah. to get a playstation for um but yeah i i liked the idea of having my account system still yeah. uh nintendo has historically been terrible at it Moving stuff between like the 3DS and the Wii and the Wii U and all of that mm -hmm. was like a nightmare. Uh, moving stuff between switches has gotten a little better. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping this new one is just you log in and everything's there. Yeah. That would be amazing. But I feel like it's not. It's not going to be Probably that. Not, you know, someone will be will be wrong. There's an argument to be had that uh, forcing people to buy a whole new system and and start from scratch is the best way to make as much money off of them as possible because they have to buy all this stuff. But my argument is like, imagine if you had to start from scratch every time you bought a new iPhone. Exactly. Yeah. Like people buy the new iPhone every year. Yeah. That's why they come out with one every year. Mm -hmm. And if you couldn't just transfer your stuff over, no one would do that. Exactly. Yeah. Everyone would hold on to their 13 year old iPhone. Yeah. Somebody in the chat, uh, I lost it. Somebody <laughs> in the chat said, uh, they, oh, there it is. Uh, Sir Newt Muscat says, it, uh, when I mentioned how many units the Switch sold, 130 or something, mm -hmm. they said that's almost as much as the entirety of Steam with hundreds of devices. So I looked it up, and Steam's Steam has 132 million monthly active users okay. on Steam. So that's a little different. I'd imagine the 130 million that Nintendo Switch owners, out of the 130 million people who bought Nintendo Switches, some of those Switches are not active. They're right. just, you know, on the shelf or whatever. Yeah. But still, 132 million monthly active users on Steam. That's any Steam device. That's, yes. that's a PC. Yes. So that's kind of a huge... Mm -hmm. That's a huge feat to be also, able to just, match that. Yeah, that's just, that's just active Steam users. Like mm -hmm. I, I forgot how many like people actually have Steam accounts. Like I have a Steam account. It's currently not active. Yeah, but you know, I think I add to the overall Steam ecosystem. Yeah, you know? I will say that most people, when they turn their computer on, Steam turns on. Yeah. So some of those guys aren't playing. Yeah. Steam, you know. I turn that shit off immediately. <laughs> and I think everybody should turn that yeah. shit off immediately. That Discord, none of that. Sh I want none of that shit turning on when I turn the computer on. Yeah, I right. want. I dictate what turns on when I turn the computer on. Yeah. All right, almost done. Uh, next up, unionization efforts uh, are gaining steam across the industry. What role do you think a union could play at Nintendo in the future? Uh, we <laughs> that's that's a good question because yeah. it's like. Because because it's like, hey, Mister Boss Man, yeah. you tell us why unions are good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we cur we don't currently have unions at Nintendo of America, and part of that is driven by the employee feedback we see, which is a high degree of job satisfaction and engagement overall. You only have to look at our retention numbers, which are very, very high within the industry, 
and our obviously low turnover rate as a result. Our focus has always been on creating a culture that's inclusive, has a work-life balance, and is focused on our singular mission of bringing smiles to faces. I think we're on the right path in terms of ensuring uh, we've got a work environment and culture that allows people to be productive, to have balance in their lives, and to grow within the company. Everyone has the right to form a union, and, cert and certainly in the future, where, uh, wherever it takes us, we'll respect that. But we're much more... But we're very much uh, focused right now on how to create the best work culture and environment we possibly can. We've all we've always listened to our workers, and we want to make sure we have both formal and informal ways of getting worker feedback and understanding the needs of our employees and where we can improve. Uh, we always act on that feedback, and as I said earlier, there is always a right. Um, there was always a right to form a union, and we respect that. So that's a very CEO answer. That is a very yeah. It's non-committal. It's not. It's not entirely anti-union, but it's also saying like, you know, we do everything we can to make sure you don't have to form one. Yeah, like they're trying to treat the workers right in a way where they don't they don't yeah. form a union. I mean, look. In fairness, like Nintendo is probably the one video game company where like you don't hear about like you know massive layoffs and like mm -hmm. poor. Uh, you never really hear about crunch at Nintendo or anything like that. I don't really hear about much at Nintendo, period. I don't hear right. much about what happens inside of those offices. I think you know? the most we've ever gotten was um, the Joy-Con repair shops, how they're overworked. They're, yeah. But those are all outsourced. And we've heard of uh, failed development. Like, they scrap right. things all the time. Right. Uh, they, they don't usually say, hey, you got to get this thing out, uh, you know, in the next couple months but like scrap development is one thing uh scrap development and then shutting down the studio is another and mm -hmm. like as far as i know nintendo rarely if ever has shut down studios like in internally not internally no there, yeah. there's there's a lot of uh, like second party studios but yeah. that's not really you know they, they usually like part ways with the second party yeah and then the studio has to shut down <laughs> because they parted ways with them usually what happens is nintendo will absorb a, a studio yeah. or or if there's an internal studio that they're shutting down they'll roll it into a yeah. different studio or give them other well, work the, to the big ones i can think of is like rare which they sold to microsoft and silicon knights um who made eternal darkness and the twin snakes and when silicon knights went independent they ran themselves into the ground yeah. for making bad games and bad that business seems games. to happen more often than yeah. nintendo making the poor decisions right yeah um last question is there a nintendo property that hasn't come back in the past few years that you would love to see make a comeback i can't think of a specific franchise that i want to see make a comeback the things i love uh to play are there maybe bowser's inside story giving bowser a little love would always be nice that's a cheap that's response. funny because his name is yes. that also bowser's inside story is not a franchise you fucking fake fan <laughs> 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 answer the question bowser <laughs> Uh, so that was the interview. That's the interview. Uh, f yeah, know, it ends with Super Mario Wonder is available exclusively for Nintendo Switch October twentieth. There you go. Uh, so there's well, it's it's admittedly not a lot to go by, but I think whenever like a big Nintendo CEO, anybody from Nintendo, any top person from Nintendo gets interviewed, uh, it's worth taking note of because like you know they have all the secrets. Again, this is the most we've gotten from somebody at nintendo talking about the next switch yeah he, he he didn't say that it's not happening he said when it does happen we will have a unified account system yeah and that is a feature yeah that they're announcing you yes. know for a system that's not out yet that's mm -hmm. kind of a big deal for mm -hmm. nintendo specifically to do even though they've kind of let that slide before this yeah. is the first time we've heard of this but it's good to see they're doubling down on that because the last time we heard about it was like in like 2019 or something. It's been like a really long time since we yeah. heard about their idea for a unified account system. Mm -hmm. Now, what would be cool if we're going to get this unified account system, yes. it'd be really cool to have this sort of Nintendo account and the games that you already buy on multiple devices. Yes. It'd be really cool if they made a little tiny one that's like $100 that, mm -hmm. plays, that, that plays low powered games. That'd be really cool. Do you cool. think the Switch 2 could possibly exist in three different varieties you have the hybrid console you have the light which is just portable but then you also have the pro which is just the 
console itself. No. You don't think so? I don't think so. But it is what I do think. Okay. You know what? You you, you know what? It could it could exist. In two different <laughs> Not that be, it, be, like because the, I don't think it's going to be 4K. Right. And it will eventually need to be 4K. <laughs> so so having a, a docked only professional model would well, would make sense. I don't sense. think the the docked only professional model is going to be more powerful mm -hmm. than the the hybrid system itself. I think it will possibly be optimized for TV play. You know, maybe it'll output at a higher resolution, uh, whereas the hybrid system will just be a 1440p or whatever. Um, and it'll come with a regular controller instead of Joy-Cons or whatnot. Well, it would need to do something to boost that extra resolution. Right. It would need to have some sort of beef in it. But I'm saying, like, it's not going to be the difference between a Series S and a Series X. In terms of power, in yeah. Terms of power, uh, yeah. Well, it, it kind of has to be. Well, th I think the difference is that the Series S and X are pretty powerful, right? And I don't see Nintendo making something that powerful. But the gap exists between the two because you're going from 1440 to, to 4K, right. and I think that if they're gonna do a Switch 2 Pro, that's the gap that they have to close. But uh, if all the reports we're seeing is su suggesting that it's going to use the DLSS for upscaling, right? And I don't know. I that's not really rendering the game itself; just the output. That of... is something that they could just slap on a dock or something. Like yeah. that's not something that warrants a whole other console, like a full, like a third SKU. That's not something that warrants that. Okay. Because that's just that's something you could just slap yeah. on. Even a TV could have that. You know, like yeah. That's not enough. You need some sort of beef in there. Also, like I'm weary about how much companies are gonna use DLSS yeah. and like rely on it. That seems like a feature that's uh, not really. People don't seem to care about it. To, yeah. to be honest with you, um, it seems like a like a. I don't have 4K. This is the next best thing. You know. I do think the Switch 2 will be at least 1440p when it's docked. Yeah. That much I I can I can I I would I would bet on. Um I think it's going to be the same situation though where in handheld it's low powered and then you plug it in mm -hmm. and it just uses the power of being plugged in to do the, do right. the shit, you know. Cuz we see a lot of these PC handhelds and they do the same thing. Yeah. When you when they're plugged into the wall, uh you can ramp that thing up and it, and it runs a lot better. Anyway, okay. um, John Crawford, thank you for gifting us up. Um, all right, uh, I wanted to let's let's talk about the games we played so far. Okay, let's talk about. Oh no, let's talk about this first. Switch oh. reveal trailer removed from YouTube. Let's talk about that. Real yes. Quick. Uh, so uh, with all the Switch Two hype, uh, something mysterious happened. Um, the Nintendo Switch was first revealed via a three-minute trailer posted to YouTube on October 20th, 2016. Uh, same day as the trailer for Logan. Don't ask me how I know that. I scrolled all the way to the bottom to yeah. make sure that there wasn't any important updates. And it says, correction, the song used in the original Switch reveal trailer was not by Imagine Dragons. <laughs> I know. All right. This is how I know that the Switch trailer came out the same day as the Logan trailer. Because I did a mashup of the song from the Switch trailer... Uh, in the Logan trailer, oh, <laughs> because the Logan trailer that. used "Hurt" by Johnny Cash. So I figured, what if we use the song from the Switch Switch trailer? That was funny. I'm a genius. <laughs> anyway, okay, uh, October twentieth, twenty sixteen. Seven years later, Nintendo has pushed the video to private, reigniting fans' excitement for a much anticipated announcement of the Switch Two, and also destroying an important piece of history in the process. The disappearance was first noticed uh, by Gaming Forum Reset Era, where users joked about what it might mean, including if a Switch 2 reveal might be imminent now. Uh, that sadly seems very unlikely given Nintendo's repeated insistence that it won't have any new hardware to discuss until the start of its next fiscal year in April 2024. The company also has two big games left to sell this year, Mario Wonder and Mario RPG Remake. Nintendo usually doesn't uh, like to steal the spotlight away from one product by surprise announcing another. 
The original 2016 Switch reveal was notable for a bunch of reasons, unlike the Wii U, which got the full red carpet rollout at E3 2011, Nintendo relied on a single YouTube trailer to get everyone excited for its successor. Instead of executives describing all of the new handheld hybrids console's functions in detail, uh, fans got to see a video of the device in action showing both people playing alone in their rooms uh, and sitting around picnic tables at night by a basketball court. Uh, the video highlighted the Switch, Switch as a machine for portability and sociability, uh, epitomized by the now infamous scene of hipsters playing Mario Odyssey at a rooftop party in the city. Uh, it eventually garnered over 15 million views. Here's a re-upload of it by GameSpot. So, uh, I mean, it's an inf- it, we don't we could shorten this article. We don't yeah. need to friggin' rehash the whole fucking trailer. Right. We all remember this trailer. I used it a thousand times in videos and yes. stuff. I don't think this is the first time they've taken this trailer down. No? No, I think they've done it before. Really? And then it just comes back up. Yeah. Uh, why did Nintendo remove it all of a sudden? Uh, is the company trying to get uh, get old marketing out of the way so a uh, similarly named Switch 2 doesn't have to compete with the algorithmic SEO abyss that is the modern internet? Or did it simply decline to renew the licensing rights for the white denim song used in the trailer? Uh, that's usually the reason why old video game marketing materials get delisted from YouTube, though it's not completely clear why Nintendo would abandon the most recognizable commercial for a console that's still selling millions of units a year, especially heading into the holiday 2023 season. Nintendo did not uh, initially respond to requests for a comment. Um, I'm trying to now look through articles to see the last time they yeah. took it down i'm seeing articles that say it was their most viewed video on the on the channel yeah which it's crazy for a youtube channel to <laughs> remove their most yeah. viewed video you know what i okay i remember this happening okay and th- i think there was a licensing issue like they did, they have to renew the uh, the license for, for the, the song. song or something. Okay. Or maybe some of the people in it. I, I don't know. Something. Don't know. There's. Uh, I think it's just a licensing issue they need to solve, and then they they'll just put it back up. Didn't Sony recently do that with a trailer? They had to remove it because of a song issue. Right. I don't know. But chat is saying they did it before the OLED. Oh, interesting. Um. Kit Ellis, uh, former head of social content of Nintendo of America. That's the guy. That's the guy. That's the guy. That's who you're talking about. He tweeted, um, Nintendo should take the steps to ensure the Switch reveal trailer stays on their channel forever. They may disagree, but as an important piece of video game history, it's time for the mindset shift on things like this now that their official museum is on the way. Um, I think he's the one who said... Last time something like this happened, I think he said, hey, it's probably a licensing issue. And then it turned out to be a licensing issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it probably is a licensing issue mm-hmm. at this point. I don't think there's some vast conspiracy that Nintendo would erase, you know, one of their most famous commercials um, in order to get... Because if they wanted to do that, they have a lot more Switch commercials they'd have to pull from their YouTube channel, you know, if they want to, like, clear the way for the next one. Uh, Lost Tech in the chat says, it wasn't music, it was posters or art in the background. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'd imagine they're going to put it back up. Yeah. It's probably some weird bureaucratic thing that they had to remove it. Yeah, I never understood why, like, video games have, like, this weird licensing with music or that movies don't. You know, because if a game loses the right to a song, then the game gets pulled or the whole soundtrack has to be renewed. Meanwhile, movies have had have the same soundtrack forever. Mm. And they never get, like, replaced. They never issue, get a new issue of, like, Goodfellas, but, like, now it doesn't have any Rolling Stones songs in it. Is it because they have a good relationship with, like, movie studios have a good relationship with the music studios? If not being the same. <laughs> aren't, aren't a lot <laughs> of them just the same? Yes. Yeah. But I, I would th- imagine at this point, you know, a lot of, you know, how many fucking millions and billions of dollars do video games make? How, you know, how much money do they get uh, for licensing these songs you know guitar hero and rock band were the biggest games for a decade the tony hawks had like the, the most popular soundtracks of any video game ever you know you would think that they would have an idea of like oh video games are a big deal we should not have weird licensing agreements with the music yeah 
Uh, Sony could do something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's all I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, Jeffrey Swords says, it's not licensing. They don't want to confuse searches for the next Switch model announcements. I don't buy that. Yeah. Uh, it, it would make sense, but I would be... It would blow my dick off if they announced a new Switch <laughs> yeah. in the next month or so, you yeah. know? Like, that'd be insane. Especially because we're in the holiday season. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And uh, again, like, there are so many other Switch commercials on Nintendo's channel. They yeah. would have to get rid of all well, of them. Well, that one is the most popular video on right. their channel. So yeah. that's a little different. I mean... The song is a banger. <laughs> well, I'm going to be honest with you. I have you guys heard of the new potential Intel gaming handheld? No, I have not. Gamers Nexus had a segment on it with footage of a prototype and talking about specs. Je uh, no, I have not. I am interested in that. Uh, Intel doesn't make computers. <laughs> no. They make other the, stuff. They make the things that go in the computer. <laughs> they make the things that go in there. They don't have like a computer, you know? Right. So having a handheld is weird. Well, That's weird. Now they make GPUs. Yeah, they're so, close. They're getting real close. Yeah, so maybe they're like, this is a long-term thing yeah. for them. You know, they make the parts that go in the computer, so now they're just going to put it all together. Um. Oh, he says Intel based. Okay, well that's that. Yeah. Now, now we're getting bored. Mm -hmm. I don't. Now I don't buy that because so many companies say they're making a PC handheld and they're gonna put an Intel in it, and then they they're like, never mind. Yeah. And they pull it, and then they just put an AMD in. It. Uh, a couple people in the chat are bringing up the NUC that Intel. Fuck actually they, used that to make. thing's actually really cool. <laughs> yeah. That thing's sick. I forgot about yeah. that. All right, they make the Nook, and the Nook yeah. is awesome. The Nook would be a cool handheld. But I don't think they're making the Nook anymore. <laughs> really? They don't yeah. have Nooks anymore? I think they're discontinuing it. I asked them for one. I asked really? them for a Nook, and they just pretended like I didn't say when, anything. When did you ask them? Because they, I think they, when is uh, they discontinuing? It was when I was working with them, like a year ago. Uh, July, they began discontinuing. Really? Yeah. Those were so cool. I wanted yeah. to put one in a, in a fight stick. Because <laughs> that would be so. I, yeah. I, I wanted to make a plug and play Street Fighter Six, you know. Yeah, thing, yeah. You know. Somebody asked where I got these cups. This is a Target. This is a Target cup. <laughs> That's it. Uh, Jeffrey said they've done it before with the OLED and the Splatoon OLED. They might have a new edition about it being announced. I think that's just the announcements for the new consoles happen to line up with when the licensing falls through. That's yeah. what I think. Um, anyway, let's talk about yes. the games we've played. Yes, I played Mario Wonder. It's I've been cool. playing Spider-Man. It is very good. Uh, I have to play Spider-Man. Mario Wonder is great. Yeah. Uh, I tweeted that I beat it in four hours and 30 minutes, and uh, a lot of people were like, oh my God, that's so such a short game. Yeah. Like, Give me credit. <laughs> I beat it extraordinarily fast. Yeah. It's not that short of a game. Mm -hmm. um, the how long to beat says eight and a half hours. It said nine, and I think it dropped down to eight and a yeah, half. Yeah. So if you're casually playing through the game, it's going to be like a good eight or more hours. Uh, if you are really casually dragging your feet through it, mm -hmm. it, it could be upwards of like 16 hours to do everything. I'm uh, right now trying to 100% it. Um, okay. And it feels way different playing it without trying to rush through the whole thing. Like, I yeah. realized that, uh, you know, so the, in the game, you each level, you get the wonder, you get a seed. That's mm -hmm. that's the star in there. You get a seed. Each level has a, a special, it has two seeds. One of them, you just get to the end. The other one is you get the the one of the wonder flowers and it changes the whole level and does all this crazy shit right in the beginning of the game i was avoiding those because sometimes they'd slow you down mm -hmm. and i didn't realize it'd actually be faster if i just try to get as many seeds as possible as quickly as i could mm -hmm. um but i went back to 100 percent and i realized all of this cool shit that i missed that i just blew tried to blow through right so the i already liked it when i was speed running it but now it's 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 a lot different and and uh I'm appreciating it more going through and trying to trying to right. do everything that I that I missed. Uh 
it's uh, one of the best 2D Mario games of all time. It's one of the it's the best 2D Mario game since the Super Nintendo. That's for for sure. Damn. Um, the abilities are pretty good. Uh, the elephant ability is good. The the bubble yeah. ability is fine. The badges are kind of a little stupid. It's cool that they're there, and it's cool to be able to like equip one before you enter a level because it makes you like think about what you want, like how you want to approach yeah, yeah. a level. But all of the badges seem pretty useless except for the sensor badge, which al- which tells you any secrets that are nearby, mm-hmm. and the the floating cap badge seems really cool. You you just you kind of get Peach's parachute yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, that is really helpful. The, in the speed running meta right now, it seems like people are using this one badge that makes it so that when you when you run off of a ledge, you keep running like it's Looney Tunes. Uh-huh. So you 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 keep going, oh. and then you can jump. Got it. So that seems to be what people are using to speed run the game. But I hate it because everything in your in your every fiber of your being yeah. makes you want to jump at the edge, but you have to go off of it now yeah. to jump. So. Uh, that I can't wrap my head around that, mm-hmm. but uh, it's amazing. It's great. It's cool. awesome. Uh, it's not four and a half hours, uh, and it's definitely worth sixty dollars. Even if it, I mean, it it'll probably take you like at at if you're rushing through it six hours if you really mm-hmm. want to. But normally, if you're just pl- trying to play through it casually, eight hours, eight and a half. Uh, I think that's worth a solid sixty dollars for sure. Nice. Very good. Uh, I have been playing Spider-Man 2. Uh, I am nine hours in. Uh, according to how long to beat, the main story plus extra is 20 and a half hours. So apparently I'm halfway through the game. Oh, wow. Which is surprising me because I just got the black suit. Oh. Yeah. I feel like there's so much. Wait, m- that's main plus extra is 20 hours? Yeah. Okay. Main, yeah. main story is 15 hours. Okay. Which means I'm more than halfway there. Yeah, but you're I always go by the main plus extra. Yeah, I'm so I'm like I'm doing extra stuff. But even still, that feels like I'm getting the black suit so close to the end. I feel like I mean may, I don't know. Maybe they do want you to just like have it and then get out of it. But I feel the last Spider Man game was very long, but was very did a very good job of like keeping its story going throughout the entire course of the game. You know, I don't feel like so far nothing feels rushed in this particular story uh, there's even like there's a level and no, a level it's a fucking open maybe it gets rushed towards the end maybe because <laughs> i mean you only have a little bit longer in the black well suit. there's a part in the beginning of the game where it's all story because it's just you as peter just walking around you're walking around aunt may's house and then you're bike riding to your old high school with harry and you're walking around the high school and like steps away from action in order to progress its narrative which mm-hmm. you know you don't really expect from a big budget triple a game to do but they're doing it so i to me it seems like there's a big focus on the story they're trying to tell in this game and i i feel like it hasn't really gotten going yet like oh. it, it's it's going like it's it's progressing but if it's only like a 15 hour game just doing the campaign and i just got the black suit I feel like, you know, it, there's going to come a point where they're just going to rush in. That's scary to me. Yeah, that seems, that's very bizarre. Yeah. I I thought that was going to be the crux of the whole game was yeah. Black Suit Spider-Man. And, and For like the, most of it, yeah. Yeah, because there's a lot of shit that comes with that. Yeah. And, and this is my problem with fucking Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> is Black Suit is so cool. Yeah. And they always like, like, like all this shit's happened. Oh, by the way, Black Suit. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like all this shit. Like that's important. Yeah, shit. Um. So, I mean, so how's the story uh, uh, so far? Though? The story so far is very good. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's um. You play as both Peter Parker and Miles Morales. They both have their own things going on. Um. Miles Morales is trying to get into college. He's trying to write his college uh, essay, but also trying to learn how to be Spider Man. And Peter's trying to teach Miles. But also his best friend, Harry Osborn, just came back from a long time away. Uh, and now Peter just wants to hang out with Harry the whole time. Um, so there's there's that dynamic going on. Uh, there's Mary Jane's aspect of it where uh, she's trying to be like a reporter for the Daily Bugle and Jonah's going to fire her at any moment. 
there is there is a Mary Jane stealth level section in the game, and which I know everybody hated from the last one, but it I feel like it's much improved here. You're you actually have a defense. You it it moves faster, and it doesn't feel like, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It it doesn't feel like it breaks the entire flow of the game. It actually feels like it's uh, moving the story forward, and it actually feels very fast paced compared to the last uh, the last game when they did that. I remember the first Spider Man had some. Was it Mary Jane missions? It was Mary Jane yeah. and Miles. Okay. Because this is before he got power. So it was, yeah, you were just like crouching through a museum. So I don't know if I, how, is Miles far into the first Spider-Man? Like, because I don't remember him from the first one at all. Like halfway through. Uh, Why is he in the world? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I didn't get far enough to understand why there's two (laughs) Spider-Men. So it does it. It doesn't do the Spider Verse thing where Miles comes from another dimension. Yeah. He just exists in this. He's world. just there. Okay. Yeah. And the first game, Spider Man meets Miles' dad first. Okay. And then, like, eventually, Miles comes into the picture because you know his dad's a cop and he's about to get you know. Okay, I remember that part. I remember. Yeah. I remember the dad now. It's yeah. coming back to me. So that's how Miles gets introduced. So how does Miles get the spider powers? The spider bites him. Just also, yeah. Just also, a spider bites him too. Wow, yeah. what a, what a coincidence! <laughs> Basically, yeah. Jesus. Um. So there's that. Uh, traversal in the game. The game is very similar to the last one in terms of like how it plays. The new mechanics that they add though are very welcome additions. Uh, traversal throughout the city. You can web sling, but you also have the wings now, and that helps out a lot getting through long distances or places where the buildings are shorter so like you're really high above and like instead of falling to get to the buildings you just activate your wings and you glide through yeah i've seen that in videos it's very different from like the arkham games the way they handle it it actually feels like you're in a wingsuit like trying to navigate through the Mm -hmm. city it doesn't feel like you know just flying but also going down you're gliding in spider-man right you're not actually like flying correct yeah um, and there there's are, some cool suits. There are. There are a lot of cool suits. Uh, I feel bad for Miles because his suits are never as good as Peter's. <laughs> but I do. I have. I'm wearing like an armored suit that I think it looks pretty good. Okay. Um, there are wind tunnels that like you can go through with the webbed wings, to, like help you like fly faster. Especially if you're going across the bridges into Queens and Brooklyn, because you have to travel the, across the whole waterbed. Mm-hmm. And if you're not by a bridge, you better be fucking flying because otherwise <laughs> you have to swim. Oh, that's. I've had to swim. Uh, so that's not fun um the side missions i feel are are much more varied you know it's not just collecting backpacks and stopping crimes and strongholds um there's still like collect you know collectibles and stuff but i feel like they're much more thought out uh certain things only peter can do certain things only miles can do uh i think they do a good job of um i mean the story is mostly about peter but i think they do a good job of splitting between the two um, you have access to um, the app that was in Miles Morales and like certain Spider-Man get certain missions from that app. Um, so yeah, it's I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's very, it's very fun. Flo says, Bob, you need to find your old apartment in Spider-Man 2. I think that uh, it's too far into Brooklyn. I think they yeah. cut it. Also, it seems like they've taken Queens and Brooklyn and condensed it like it's yeah. not it's not a one-to-one yeah it's um i think they like like queens kind of hooks over brooklyn to an extent also in the way the maps laid out it does in real life yeah in real life yeah um it reminds me of uh the division i was excited that that was in manhattan and yeah. i was running around trying to find all cool shit Maybe it was Spider-Man 1, actually, now that yeah. I think about it. I was trying to find my old job in Manhattan, and right. uh, it cut from uh, from 23rd Street to 17th Street. It just yeah. deleted a big chunk of Manhattan, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, the, um, the map is bigger, for sure, but it's still not the entirety of Manhattan Island. Yeah. Uh, apparently the Chrysler building is not in this game, but it was in the first one, because the Chrysler building wanted more money to be put in the game. Oh, that's a licensing thing with Apparently, that building? Yes. My God. Because that's Chrysler Building's a big deal for Spider-Man. Yeah. That's a, that's a Spider-Man statement. Yeah, that's where the Kingpin hung out in the cartoon. Yeah. So. 
Come on, Chrysler building. Yeah, seriously, get fucked. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I looked up. Uh, I was curious because I do want to play it, yeah. uh, but I'm probably going to play it in my living room. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a 4K TV, but it's, it's a PlayStation Five. I want as much frames as I can get. So there's there's uh there's performance mode and there's fidelity mode. Um, yeah, pr- fidelity mode is 4K, but it's 30. Uh, performance mode is I think 1440, but 60. Oh, really? 1440? Yeah. I think so. Apparently there's a is your TV uh, 120 hertz? No, because apparently there's a mode where if you're playing that one is that one. Is. So if you hook it up to that, mm-hmm. apparently there's a mode if you hook it up to a TV with 120 hertz, you can play the game at 40 frames per second and 4K. Why? I don't know. Why does it have to be? Why does it need that? I don't know. That's I'm, I'm that doesn't not make an any sense. Engineer. Uh. 1440p is where performance mode tops out. Yeah. The average resolution there fluctuates between 1080p and 1440p. Variable refresh rate. That's what it needs. Yeah. Okay. So so that means it's not going to be 40. It means it's going to be somewhere between 30 and 40. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, here it is actually. It also supports 120 hertz output, a feature that Insomniac added to Rift Apart in a post-launch patch. So you'll have more visual options if your PS5 is hooked up to a 120 hertz panel. There you okay. go. Okay. Enabling this setting allows the fidelity mode to run at a target of 40 frames per second instead of 30. And the improvement in fluidity and input latency is palpable. Uh, that's something I'm worried about input latency because I never play on my live in my living room yeah. on that TV and that TV's not a great TV. Uh and I'm too used to playing on computer monitors which have much lower latency. Yeah. It's a great middle ground between the performance mode and the standard fidelity mode delivering the image quality and clarity of the latter setting at a frame rate that feels more responsive. It's the way to go if you're lucky enough to be playing on a 120 hertz display like the LG C1 television. The only drawback is that at 40 frames per second, the resolution understandably can dr- can drop a bit further with the average ending up somewhere between a hun- 1296p and 4K, according to Insomniac. So saying that it supports 120 hertz output is misleading because it's not that. Right. It's has extra features if you have a 120 hertz panel that's how you word yeah. that do you put your tv in game mode when you play because that actually does help with latency i don't know if it has a game mode it has a, it should it has the the a picture mode but i don't know if it i don't remember if it's game you should look and see because that, that does help with latency okay. yeah. i know that uh it has like the picture modes are like dynamic and standard. Yeah. Um, no, dynamic, standard, and neutral. Okay. And I would put it on neutral, and it would keep going back to dynamic. Okay. And it looks horrible. All yeah. the lights are blown out, but it does that because that's what you would use in like Best Buy. If you have it showing, you'd put it in dynamic mode because right. you want it to look as bright as possible. So people go, oh, what's that? Yeah. So it kept switching back to dynamic. And I'm like, why is it? What is it in fucking demo mode? It keeps switching back. Yeah. So what, after like a year I, uh, to my roommate, I was I was like, keep switching back. The thing yeah. keeps, I don't know what it is. He goes, oh no, I'm doing that. <laughs> he was taking it from, yeah. from neutral to dynamic because he liked the dynamic right. mode. See, this is why I TV fucking should just rip my hair out. Yeah, TV should just come like with one picture mode. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I would have had to have put parental locks on yeah. my, my fucking TV. You should have. <laughs> if you uncap the FPS on the performance mode, you can get above 60 frames per second. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I only have 60 frames where my PS5 is. Mm-hmm. I doubt I'm gonna try to hook it up to any other monitor that i have because i if it's not going to get 120 frames or if it's not going to get above 60 frames why am i bothering yeah you know it's weird that you if you need a if you have a 120 hertz panel then you can get 40 frames per second that's weird yeah i guess it's the variable refresh rate 
But then it's like, why not just have variable ref why not say if you have variable refresh rate, then you can get 40 frames per second? Why say if you have a 120 hertz panel, you can get variable refresh rate? I think, That's weird. I think it has a lot to do with apparently ray tracing is activated across all modes. Mm -hmm. So I don't maybe that has something to do. You know what it is? It? No, you know what it is? It's Sony doing <laughs> weird, dumb bullshit, like locking features behind other features yeah. and stuff. That's what it is. Typically, 60 hertz TVs don't have variable refresh rate. That's yeah. what it is. My brain is always in monitor mode because right. I don't deal with TVs anymore. Yeah. So like six, I have 60 hertz monitors that have mm -hmm. variable refresh rate. These days, with these modern consoles, people are plugging them into monitors. So yeah. we need to start, you know... But using like, language that includes that. But I feel like just as many people are still plugging them into TVs. Yes, yes. So they should be built for TVs. They should be built for TVs. But when you're saying things like if you have a 120 hertz panel, you're going to get yeah. this feature. When it's actually a variable refresh rate feature, that is misleading. Right. Because if, if you, the TV could have variable refresh Just say if your TV has variable refresh uh -huh. rate. If your display has variable refresh rate, that's the way you should word it. I'm going to lose my fucking mind. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'm, trying, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about Spider-Man. Is there anything you want to say about Mario? Here's something I want to say about Mario. Nintendo Life has an article. What controller are you using for Super Mario Wonder? Oh, that's a good question. And here's a Xeon right there. Okay. Uh, I kind of want to know. What should I, what do I, what did you use? Oh, you, do you think what I used is going to be on their little list here? I'm guessing you used a keyboard. <laughs> yes, I used one I built. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, What should I even... I mean, other. Well, what's the vote? What are the options? All right, we got Joy-Con, Pro Controller, NES Pad, SNES Pad, N64 Pad, Switch Lite, Hori Split Pad Pro, 8-Bit Do Pro 2, Nitro Deck. And then other. The wide majority are using a pro controller. I think okay. that that is because these are Nintendo Life readers. Yeah. I would imagine the vast majority of people are using Joy-Cons. Yeah. Because that's the most available to them. Yeah. Um, but a but, pro controller sounds pretty standard. Yeah. But would you say a pro controller is the best? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean... The the second most here, so you got Switch Pro Controller at 51%, at 17%, which is a wide gap, but that's the second most used, and that is a Super Nintendo pad. Yeah. So I'm assuming that's the official uh, yeah. Nintendo I'm, Switch Online. Uh, see, I feel like with 2D games, people just default to D-pad is best for that, yeah. which makes a Not lot of sense. Not enough people are doing Apparently, that. Apparently, yeah. I think, I think plenty of people are just fine using an analog stick with it. They which, are, and those people need to be committed. <laughs> which to you know us old people seems weird. So I tweeted but... this uh, because our buddy Fried Biscuits was playing. Uh, mm -hmm. He's he was playing Mario Wonder, and he goes, "I'm using an analog stick. It sucks. I I, yeah, I yeah. hate it." And I was like, "Why are you using an analog stick?" Um, and then I realized like most people are gonna have just Joy Cons. They're gonna yeah. have what came with the system. So. Instead of spending fifty dollars on a controller just to play Mario Wonder, what's another way that you could get a better D pad? Yeah. How about a Joy Con grip that just moves the left Joy Con <laughs> up a little bit? Right. So that the D pad is a good see spot. That, yeah. So I tweeted that and uh a surprising amount of people think I'm a psycho. <laughs> it is a very shocking design. It's weird. It's yeah, it's, it's weird it's, looking. Yeah. It's I mean, yeah. Yeah, so, but a, a lot of people are like, I play with the analog stick. Analog stick's fine. Nothing wrong with the analog stick. For most people, the analog stick is going to be fine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Fine. And you know, the Joy-Con notoriously does not have a good D-pad because it doesn't have a D-pad. Yeah. So I'm sure it's people got don't D, want. It's got D buttons. Yeah, I'm sure people don't want to play with those. Honestly, though, mm -hmm. they're fine. Yeah. Some people prefer the split up directional buttons. Some people right. prefer the the PlayStation controller yeah. buttons. That's weird because the PlayStation controller buttons, I don't think are, I think it's still a D pad underneath. Underneath, I think, yeah, yeah. So that's like it, it doesn't feel like split up buttons. Yeah. Um. Anyway, 
Uh, yeah, I play with a freaking keyboard thing. It's awesome. Yeah. So everybody start doing, everybody plug your keyboards in these switches. <laughs> uh, with Spider-Man, I've been seeing a lot of people like disappointed by the open world. Mm-hmm. Like I saw a tweet, somebody tried to go into the subway, but he couldn't go in all the way. And like he made a big stink about it. It's like, this is all just window dressing. I'm like, there's a whole fucking <laughs> everything else you, you do in that game. And you're you're upset because Spider-Man can't ride the subway. It's the it's the problem you're gonna have when your game can do so much and it looks so real. Yeah. That people are gonna be disappointed when when the reality gets broken down. But like you know? You're look at that point. I feel like you're looking for things to criticize. Yeah, and you're gonna find the one thing to criticize, and that's gonna be your. But argument. when it looks, when you're in, when it feels like the real world, and then all of a sudden you hit an invisible wall, it's gonna it's gonna be really. This jarring. wasn't an invisible wall. He posted on Twitter. He walked down the stairs into the subway to try and go in, and then came out. He he purposely tried to go in hmm. the subway. Why do? Why would Spider Man? That's need to ride point. the train. That's a yes, good point. Yes, I know the loading screens in the first game were Spider-Man riding the train. <laughs> it was funny. Doesn't mean you actively want to ride the subway. To get into Queens. Yeah. It's easier than... Than trying to swing across the bridge. They probably would take a lot of uh, cardio to swing around like that. He's Spider-Man, though. He's, like, at the best cardio. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh... Yeah, I'm going to play it eventually. I don't know it's, how much I'm going to play it. It's very good. It really needs the story really needs to grab me and the combat really needs to not be boring <laughs> because I get burnt out on that shit so easily. The combat does feel a little bit tougher this time mm-hmm. around. I feel like I find myself using more of my my gadgets <laughs> and like my abilities more so than in the last game where it was just like dodging and countering and like punching yeah in those types of games i'm usually just like oh i gotta i gotta punch like 18 dudes yeah and i just fucking hit the x button oh triangle uh x yeah no you know. it's um it's a it's a little bit more in depth than that they added a parry mechanic okay i like um, that i don't because i can never get the timing right so i always get knocked down so i always have to wait for one of my super abilities to charge up and then attack the people who i need to mm-hmm. parry against okay so that's something to look out for um but the the story so far i mean again i don't know where i am in the story apparently because apparently i'm halfway through uh it is very good i just hope it's not rushed towards the end because there's a lot of balls juggling i hear there's a lot of cutscenes or like long cutscenes. yes yeah yeah uh anyway more spider-man news uh oh no first no i I moved it okay why do we oh wait is that breaking news it's breaking news okay we gotta talk about it. yeah i moved it back uh we got a game coming to switch online plus expansion pack Oh, this was just announced. It's Mario Party 3. Oh, God help me. Yeah. It's, I mean, hey, man, N64 games, cool. I mean, look, I know we have opinions on the Mario Party games. Mm-hmm. I know people have opinions on Mario Party games. For what it's worth, people don't really complain about the N64 Mario Party games as much as the later entries in the series. No, these are people's favorite games. I don't know favorite if that's Mario just Party games. blind nostalgia or the fact that these are actually good, but they're not. <laughs> they're uh this is the best Mario Party has been. Yeah. But Mario Party is bad. Right. And there and that's it. There it is. The the core foundation that Mario Party is built off of yeah is it's horrible right it's due for a reinvention for a killing. of just some time yeah. murder it never make another one again right that's and that's it anyway uh so there you go if you're if you're stupid you got a <laughs> new game to play uh all right back to spider-man back to spider-man ps5 slim bone to wow a uh, reliable leaker behind the early PlayStation Plus lineup release uh, reveals has reported that the PlayStation 5 slim release date for the U.S. as well as what appears to be its first bundle. Uh, Bill Bilkun, uh reporting on the French website uh, Deal Labs, said that the PS5 Slim Standard Edition bundle with Insomniac Spider-Man 2 launches in the U.S. on November 8th, priced at uh, $559.99. That's the same price as the current Standard Edition of a PS5 with Spider-Man. Okay. 
Uh, Bibble Coon also mentioned the release date of November 10th for the standard and the digital versions of the PS5 Slim in the US. So perhaps there will be a stagger release throughout that week with the uh, bundle going live ahead of the new console st uh, standalone launch. The smaller PS5 design comes with a one terabyte, blah, blah, blah. We talked about that last week. So I here's, here's my hot take. Mm -hmm. Here's my theory. Yeah. It's possible this was uh, planned because of Spider-Man. Yeah. But it took too long to release the slim version. Yeah. So they decided to go with the regular PlayStation first. Yes, that makes sense. And this Spider-Man slim model might never actually happen. Well, it's like it might have been planned, but they scrapped it for the original. Right. Version. Well, this is just a bundle. It's not like a. It's not like the special edition that oh, I have. I thought it was a special. Never mind. No, it's Never just mind. a bundle. <laughs> For those of you wondering, the lights in this room just wow. turned on. It's a little <laughs> bright in here. Jeez. Okay. That was scary. Sony's listening on us. <laughs> they don't want us talking bad about their bundle. No, so there's the special edition bundle, which I have with the that comes with the panels of the controller. Then there was a standard edition bundle that came with the regular system. That, plus I, I remember that now, yeah. This sounds like they're doing that again, but with the slim model. Okay. That I mean probably. That makes sense. I guess, yeah. I don't know about this holiday. Well, now would be the time to do it. You know, if you're would waiting, it? if you're, if you've been waiting for the slim model and you want to play Spider-Man, I think they can make more money if they don't do the bundle because <laughs> people, people who want, people are going to want the slim adding a game as incentive to get the slim well, isn't really going to help. That's going to be for people who don't already own a PlayStation or don't have Spider-Man yet. Yeah. So. It, according to the article, they're going to come out with the discless version, the disc version, and the disc version with Spider-Man. Okay. So it's three different versions. You pick which one Maybe you want. that's the Costco version. Maybe. That's the that's yeah. that's my theory. I'm sticking to it. Okay. That's the Costco version. So there's that. There are multiple ways to get a PlayStation with Spider-Man this year. Uh, apparently, Spider-Man's also having physical... Fi physical issues he hasn't done enough cardio this, <laughs> this was this was weird to me players who bought the physical copy of spider-man 2 are having difficulty installing the game on their ps5s the issue was flagged by a user in the spider-man 2 subreddit on friday who reported that the game's installation after installing the disc stops at 36 percent the user uh the user said that they tried everything to keep the installation going uh, from disconnecting the PS5 from the internet and allowing the disc to install first to resetting the PS5, they even tried uh, getting another disc at GameStop with no results. Uh, the Reddit post spawned a reset error thread which saw similar reports of users having the same issue with their Spider-Man 2 disc. They also tried getting, uh, they also tried everything to get the game working, including deleting and installing it five times, cleaning the system cache, and rebuilding the database but the installation uh, still wouldn't progress past 36%. Um, this is the first ever physical disc that I have received that did not work, they said. Maybe I'm lucky, uh, but in this case, it's not a one-off since there's now several reports of the installation stopping at 36%. I mean, that sounds like it's not the disc. It sounds like it's, cor it's corrupting on the drive. On the disc drive or the... No, on the drive it's installing to it sounds like it gets corrupted and then just fr freezes it doesn't like buying it i'm saying buying a whole other disc doesn't sound like it's going to fix the problem right it yeah. look it seems like there's a manufacturing issue with it because this isn't happening with any other disc based game that mm. i can think of you know no it's 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 not a fault of I don't think it's a fault of the drive specifically. I think it's just something with Spider-Man is is talking bad with the drive, and then yeah, that would be a problem with the code on the disc. The co yeah, I'm saying the physical disc being like scratched isn't like a, like buying a new disc isn't gonna fix the problem. Is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. yeah. If, there's, if the code on the disc, whatever. But you would, you know, I feel like that makes sense. You know, you buy a game, it's not working. You try it for another version. You know, that's that's what you do. You, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't have done. I, I, I would have deleted 
everything off of the drive. Not everything. I would have deleted the game off of the drive and then tried again. That's right. But you see, it's not working. Yeah. But like, it would it would make sense for somebody to go to the store and say, "Hey, this isn't working. Can I exchange it for another?" Yeah. One? Yeah. And that, get another one, and then it's still not working. That that proves there's a problem with the game itself, not your system. But y- yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, or it, the disc. Right. <laughs> Insomniac has not commented on the issue on its official channels, but it did advertise a link to tech support for fans having issues with the game. Three days before Spider-Man 2 was released, Insomniac posted a statement to Twitter um, saying that uh, players who buy the disc version do not have to download the day one patch, but highly recommended that they download patch 1.001.002 on launch day before they start playing so the game's opening will be polished. So uh, IGN okay, that's is, a different issue. That's a different issue. Okay. Uh, IGN has reached out to Insomniac for comment on the issue. Jay Cannon in the chat says it seems to be only uh, EU discs or EU Spider-Man games. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so, ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. We don't, we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> USA. 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 <laughs> um. Wow. Surprise. Sony's having, PlayStation 5s are having problems. <laughs> I mean, it's their biggest game of the holiday season. You would expect better from this. Hey, man, I wanted to play Mario Wonder, and I put the cartridge in and hit play. Yeah. And it it played. But again. (laughs) And it was great. (laughs) Like, okay, like, we've talked about this before. Like, the uselessness of discs in this generation and last generation, Mm -hmm. because most games are just digital downloads anyway. The disc is just there as, like, a form of copy protection why isn't this game just downloading from the internet? Yeah. You know? Or that should be the fix. If if there's if it's freezing at 36%, yeah. okay. Authenticate that I have the disc. Yeah. Download it, please. Yes. You know? That should be like the fail safe. Yeah. You know, like, hey, something's wrong. We're gonna just download and it. Yes, I get like no internet. Like you you wanna like have something on the actual disk drive, but like that's not the way they're making games anymore. No. Like I'm not I don't Happy want that. Yeah, yeah. That's I don't not want the that. world I want to live in, but that is the world I live in. I don't want that to be the only way to play the game. Yeah. But if I'm having an issue, mm-hmm. that seems like the way, like a like a fix. You could fix it with mm-hmm. that. For the record, also Mario Wonder, I think is three gigabytes. Let me look that it up. It amazes me <laughs> to no end. No, I'm serious. It amazes me to no end how like Nintendo can make like the best games, and they're like. You know, they could fit on a thumb drive. Meanwhile, every Call of Duty is like 200 gigs. I'm sorry. I've, I'm I'm wrong. Mario Wonder is four gigabytes. Ooh. <laughs> I'm going to have to delete some stuff I'm going to have to make some room on that thing. Uh, anyway. Anyway. Hey, Starfield had a lot of issues, too. Yes, but... Apparently, it was the best-selling game of September. This scares me. <laughs> this scares me because it sets a pres- pres- precedent. precedent. Sets a pre- it sets, sets a precedent, a precedent. <laughs> that uh, it, they're going to just fucking charge for Game Pass games now. Yeah. Uh, Bethesda's newest uh, giant role-playing game, Starfield, which hit uh, Xbox's Game Pass service the day of its release, enjoyed a very loud launch last month. In fact, its developer singled it out as the biggest Bethesda game launch of all time. Now, new data from consumer analytics company uh, Circana backs up that boast with some numbers. If you look at Circana sales data for September, you'll see that Starfield was the best-selling game in the U.S. that month. That month, um, add-on spending like the $35 premium edition upgrade many Game Pass players um, tacked on to their uh, free base game to get it early uh, to get its early access wasn't accounted for in the data which means that Starfield taking the number one uh, dollars earned spot here even more impressive. So that doesn't include the people who bought the DLC to get all the access to it in Game Pass. So this is just counts people who bought the game proper. So it's not even including Game Pass? Correct. Starfield, Starfield achieved, achieved the sales, sales records, records in spite, spite of Game Pass, Pass which, which parent company Microsoft, Microsoft reportedly uh, recognizes causes a decline in base game sales 12 months following their addition to the service. Wow. Starfield's next 11 months of sales then could be more contentious. Uh, there are already signs of its fresh paint chipping. 
On Steam's global top sellers chart, the latest Bethesda RPG fell a steep 26 spots from last week's placement uh, to a miserly ranking of 45, sitting between The Division 2 and Lies of P, uh, the latter of which also seems to suffer from dwindling hype. Starfield is performing a bit better on Steam's US-only charts, um, lazing around the 27th spot, um, though it dropped 12 spots from its ranking there last week. I I decided to look at the game releases for September because uh, I was like, there must have been nothing great if Starfield is the best-selling game. Uh, there was some good stuff, yeah. uh, namely Baldur's Gate 3, yes. which is a top seller too. I'd like to know how far behind Baldur's Gate was from... from... I don't think Baldur's Gate is selling... Like, it's selling well, obviously, but I don't think it's selling... Triple A, triple like, A numbers. Yeah, like yeah. like uh, it's one of the best selling games of the year. Yeah, but when you're comparing it to Starfield, which was hundreds of millions of dollars and anticipated see. for like six years, yeah, it's a little it's a little different. Where's the? I brought my Switch out because uh, Ivysaurus in the chat says, "Bob, how much space does your SD card have since you use all digital?" Um, I I still have some physical games. Yeah. Um. I have a one terabyte card in here, and I have 247 gigabytes left. Also, uh, I have three, 35 gigabytes left in my internal memory, because this is an OLED. Right. I think I need to just bite the bull and get a terabyte SSD, because I'm running yeah. that space. They're cheap yeah. now. They, yeah. they now, breaking news, They SanDisk is releasing a 1.5 terabyte SSD, uh, micro SD card. Uh, Sandisk, very expensive. Lexar, very affordable. I mean, you you gotta get a deal on Amazon. Yeah, the the, the Amazon deals for Sandisks are are they're pretty are good, very good. Um, Luxar is good too. Yeah, uh, there's only a handful of good uh store storage companies. Yeah, you got uh Sandisk, which is also uh, Western Digital. I think Western Digital and Sandisk. Uh huh um samsung seagate uh lexar like we said i want to say pdp but that's not it what is pny it? pny is, yeah. pny is decent yeah they're pretty good um my ps5 has a silicon power ssd um which works really well I think uh, they're on the smaller end did you it. say kingston i did not say kingston kingston's kingston's good, good. Yeah. yeah and that's it yeah nothing else everyone else beware yeah don't worry don't get anything else than that um i have for my cameras yeah i use uh i use a weird one it's like a weird like like uh let me find it, it, it it's an it's an sd yeah it's a weird like a uh, like camera like store like a, like a b h <laughs> type thing yeah. uh but what the okay ritz gear that's the name oh, of the I've, SD yes, card. Yes, I've seen those. Yeah. Uh, because it's 280 megabits per second. It's insanely yeah. fast. It's only 256 gigabytes, but it's insanely fast. So it's when the, I put it into the computer, everything transfers it's super It's UHS-2 also. Yes. Which apparently you need on our cameras for 4K. Yeah. Um, not a lot of companies make those, apparently. No, and this is, I think, the fastest end of read-write speed on a UHS-2. Yeah. So that's why... And these things are fucking expensive. This one yeah. is uh, $200 for a 256 gigabyte. Yeah, that's... But I, I have a bunch of these because uh, because of how fast it is to transfer yeah. from the camera when you're when you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have the, uh, the Circana Top 20 for September. Okay. Uh, number one is Starfield. Mm -hmm. Number two is Mortal Kombat. Damn. Uh, number three is EA Sports Football Club 24. Those are all new. Those okay. are all September releases. Number four is Madden. Uh, number five is Payday 3. Six is NBA 2K24. Seven is The Crew Motorfest. Eight is Armored Core 6. Nine is Hogwarts Legacy. Ten is Modern Warfare 2. Eleven is Jedi Survivor. Twelve is Resident Evil uh, 4. 13 is Tears of the Kingdom. Resident Evil 4. Yeah. Holy shit. Uh, 14 is Minecraft. So. 15 is Mario Kart 8. <laughs> I'm going to say that I don't think this includes digital. Uh, the Nintendo games 
it's there are asterisks on what don't include digital. Okay. And the Nintendo games and NBA 2K24 don't include digital. Because I don't think Baldur's Gate has a physical. No, at all. Baldur's Gate is not in the top 20. That's interesting. Uh, uh, so Sir Muscat sent me uh, Steam info. Uh-huh. And Baldur's Gate is number three best-selling game as of right now. Okay. So... I, I think Baldur's Gate sold a, a lot for we're what not, it is. Yeah. Uh, we're not saying Baldur's Gate has sold poorly. No. We're just, I, but I think something there's a disparity right. between the statistics. The, there probably is. I don't think... Not every... I, I don't know the way... Like, Circana used to be the NPD group. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, like, not every oh. company... Like, I didn't know they changed their name. Yeah. I think not every company, like, gives their information to them. So there's always like discrepancies. Like they said, like Nintendo is not reporting the digital sales of Mario Kart 8 or Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, Take Two is not dis- divulging the digital sales of NBA 2K24. Uh, Clarus says Larian has not shared the sales data. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Wasn't Baldur's Gate 3 on early access for over a year on Steam? It was on early access for a while, yeah. Really? Yeah. Couldn't have been that long. Uh, no, it was. Because it fucking exploded when it came out. Yeah, it exploded this year. Let me see. Baldur's Gate 3 was an early access. Steam database is a great resource. It makes estimates based in Steam reviews as well as other variables. A partial version of the game was released in early access in 2020. Oh. The game remained in early access until its full release on October 3rd, 2023. Okay. So, so like a little demo. Yeah. When I hear early access, I, I imagine the game is just, it's the game. They just are like, oh, it's not ready yet. Yeah. But it's like the game. It's like the whole thing. Okay. Uh, Let's plow through the rest of the shit. Okay. We got Star Wars Heritage Pack. Wow. All right. No, this is, this is a weird one. Because the physical version of Star Wars Heritage Pack for Nintendo Switch is set to launch on December 8th. The seven-game bundle collects Switch ports of some classic Star Wars games for $60, which is $20 cheaper than the $80 digital version that launched in April. The Heritage Pack includes The Force Unleashed, Knights of the Little Republic 1 and 2, Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast, and Jedi Academy, uh, Republic Commando, and Star Wars Episode 1 Racer. Uh, while the price difference makes the Star Wars Heritage Pack Physical Edition a better deal than the digital version, it is worth noting that only some of the games are included on cartridge. <laughs> Force Unleashed, Jedi Outcast, Jedi Academy, Republic Commando, and Racer are playable directly from the cart, while Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2 are downloadable content, so you'll need internet access and enough storage space on your Switch to play them. That may disappoint some players who prefer to have all the content on cartridge, but the upshot is that you're getting seven awesome Star Wars games, most of them physically, for $20 less than buying the the collection on the Switch eShop. So why is there such a big, a $20 gap in price between the physical version and the digital version? That is a huge gap. Yeah. Uh, So, um... Especially when, like, it's more expensive to produce a cartridge than it is to put it on the eShop. Yeah, so I was going to say, we typically see uh, games cheaper physically, but it's because, like, they usually just go on sale yeah, at the like store that's selling them. They're trying to get rid of their inventory. Yeah, so that happens a lot, but this is upon release. Yeah. And it's a big difference in price. Yeah. And $80 is a lot for seven games that are over 20 years old i mean seven games is is a lot of games but for one pack of like like what like if it's it's physically one game you know it's one cartridge one pack and you're charging 80 dollars for that digitally that's something seems wrong with the listing yeah (laughs) something's broken there is costco the cheapest way to get mario wonder right now probably how much is costco selling it for I was I just know, they, in Costco. They always look. do shit like that. Yeah. Remember, wasn't it the cheapest place to get a... Oh, no, no. It, here's what it is. You go to Costco. You get the packs of 100 gift cards. Yes. $100 gift cards. 
for like $80. Yeah. And then you take that and you buy the vouchers. That's what you do. Speaking of which, I still have a voucher I think I got to use. There you go. Anyway. Uh, yeah, no, this is weird. Uh, this yeah. I this could be Aspire doing something weird. This Yeah, this may be their way of like trying to hide the fact that they um, messed up with the DLC for KOTOR 2. Yeah. Did I, did I tell a story on the podcast? I was When I was at New York Comic Con, my friend and I went to the Limited Run Games booth. And they had the special edition of KOTOR 2. And my friend was looking at it and was like, wanted to buy it. But I, I told him what happened with the DLC. Mm-hmm. How they said they were going to put it out. And um, then they said they didn't. So people are suing them. Somebody came up behind us and said, and asked, sorry, did you say they patched the game? Because I remember there was like an issue with like, it was there was a bug and they needed to patch it. I said, no, they canceled the DLC that they promised they were going to release for it. And he goes, oh man, that sucks. And he walked away. I remember that. So I cost Limited Run Games a sale. Well, I think the episode before we talked about that, we were talking about how people bought, well, they're being sued. Yeah, no, we talked about it on the podcast. People yeah. bought the game. Yeah. And then they're dis in anticipation for the DLC, and now they're disappointed that they're not the going to get the DLC. Coming, so yeah. this is a real life example that you and I was like, who's fucking doing that? Who's buying a game for yeah. DLC that's coming out? And now you had a real life example yeah. of a guy who was excited <laughs> about the DLC. Well, it's, it's just the game as a whole because that was a big selling point. Yeah. Though it was it was yeah. the lost content. Mm-hmm. Now you can only get that on PC. So, all right, next Skull Island developer developed in one year. Yes. Oh, this game. Yes. Uh, I was I th- when I saw this article, I thought Monkey Island. I was like, wow, that's <laughs> no. pretty quick that they made that game. No. Uh, though it's easy to see why uh, Skull Island might have garnered the moniker of worst game of the year. After speaking with developers involved with making the game, one fact became clear. Skull Island is the is the best it possibly could have been uh, because it was produced in under restrictive circumstances imposed by its publisher, the Minnesota-based gaming company Game Mill Entertainment. The Verge spoke with developers involved with the game who explained uh, that through the team at Iguana Bee, which developed Skull Island, is extremely talented. That talent was not able to be fully uh, expressed because Game Mill uh, only allowed one year for the team to develop the game from scratch. The development process of this game was started in June of last year and it was aimed to end on June 2nd of this year. So <laughs> one year development process said a developer at Iguana Bee who wished to remain anonymous. Um, Iguana Bee is an independent developer based in Santiago, Chile, uh, that has worked on a number of games, including original and licensed properties. Uh, it has worked on a number of projects for Game Mail Entertainment, including Little League World Series Baseball 2022, which, according to sources, was also only allowed one year for development. In fact, Game Mill seems to have a reputation for contracting smaller developers to make licensed games under short turnaround times with varying degrees of success and quality. Uh, it was very common for us not to be provided with all the information about the project, said a former Iguana Bee developer, who did not work on Skull Island specifically, but other Game Mill published games at Iguana Bee, uh, which was quite frustrating when working because we had to improvise with the limited information we had on hand. They spoke about how even though Game Mill was funding a particular project, the funding apparently wasn't enough to keep experienced staff on hand. I remember very well that they let go of a colleague who had been there longer than me, the developer said. Deep down, I knew it was because the publisher didn't provide them with enough funding to maintain a certain number of people for an extended period. Uh, Games can be made in a year depending on things like scope, the size of the team working on it, and whether there are existing materials to work from. However, with a game like Skull Island, which according to sources was made from scratch with anywhere between 2 and 20 people working on it at a time, a one-year development timeline will be a challenging task. Uh, the Verge reached out to Game Mill for comment. Uh, the unfortunate situation that Iguana Bee, uh, suffered, the unfortunate situation is that Iguana Bee will suffer from this despite the fact that it's, it is the studio with talent capable of making excellent award-winning games. Last year, in collaboration with Studio Voyager and the publisher under Untold Tales, uh, it launched the original game, What Lies in the Multiverse. The puzzle platformer has positive reviews on Steam and won Best Game Latin America at the International Games uh, Festival, an indie game festival focused on games developed in Latin America. Uh, yeah, have you heard of G.I. Joe Operation Blackout? I heard. I have, yes. That's another one of one that, of their games. That's an Iguana B one? Uh, apparently. 
Uh, I, yeah. I went to their website and I was clicking around. Uh, yeah. Here's the G.I. Joe Operation Blackout page. It does this cool thing where when you scroll, the gears turn. <laughs> the gears are not turning properly. Properly. No, they're, they're working against each yeah. other. <laughs> I've heard this game is like fine. It's pretty mid. It's just like a run and gun shooter. There's mm -hmm. not like a lot of like depth to it. It's fairly repetitive, but like it's it's functional you know you play as either the joes or the cobras they're using the modern art style which i like a lot it's 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 more functional than kong skull yes skull <laughs> probably because they had hasbro money okay yeah um yeah i mean I, I well who who whose money is kong skull island who's who's commissioning game mill they're the publisher they funded it and they yeah say, but who who paid that like what's the licensing because like uh, gi joe they're being paid to make that right right or it's not like they just got the license and no yeah ha like i think hasbro went to them or like went to a publisher yeah. who went to them uh i don't know paramount right no it's, there's a company that owns the kong license but it's very like confusing because there's that court case where like Universal Studio Universal Studios made the original King Kong movies and they sued Nintendo saying like hey Donkey Kong's a ripoff of us but Nintendo proved that Universal once said Kong is in public domain. Mm -hmm. So T Kong is technically in public domain but there's a company that owns the rights to the Skull Comic Island. Comicbook.com says King Kong's complicated rights issues explained. I'm not going to read this. Right. I'm just going to scroll to the bottom and see if there's just <laughs> see if they figure it all out franchise let's see here the film will be in public domain in january 1st 2029 the 1933 film yes okay so i i don't know <laughs> okay I've 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 lost interest. Yeah. Um Kojima isn't mentioned in Metal Gear Solid Collection. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm not very surprised by this. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. Uh Hideo Kojima's name isn't in the new credits for Metal Gear Solid Master Collection Volume 1. Kojima, whose relationship with Konami went sour during the development of Metal Gear Solid 5 uh, and led him to cutting ties with the publisher, isn't named in the credits of the new collection. This has been confirmed by multiple players who received early copies of the game and are streaming it on Twitch. Kojima's name still appears in the credits of the individual games themselves, as they are simply ports of the original games with little alteration, but the wrappers for each game, which contain their own credit screen, don't mention Kojima, nor do they mention David Hayter or the rest of the cast. Oh. Instead, the collection's new credits simply thank all original Metal Gear series fans and staff. <laughs> Uh, while Konami is under no obligation to add new credits, mid, uh, a new credit name check, Kojima. Sorry, I'm going to start that again. While Konami is under no obligation to add a new credit name check in Kojima in a re release of its games, it, this isn't the first time a remaster has failed to acknowledge the creators of its source material by name. Earlier this year, developers who worked on the original Metroid Prime criticized the Prime remaster for omitting them from its credits. Well, that's weird because that yeah. was. They removed the, the the credits. Yes. In in this case, uh, the credits are still there for the game. Yeah. It's what is this now? The the overall credits the for overall, the whole the thing? overall collection doesn't mention Kojima at all. I'm assuming yeah. that the collection has its own set of credits in like a setting somewhere. Yeah. And like a, I don't th I don't know if it's in this article, but there was one where it said um. Like it was given like the history of Metal Gear Solid series, and it it is just said like the team at Konami. Oh, uh, okay, that's yeah. that's not cool. Yeah, I, I feel less bad if there's like a section in the collections settings that's like here's the people that worked on the this collection. Yeah, because each individual game has the credits of the actual games. You know, yeah. that's like different. They have different types of credits for different things. Um. Anyway. I'm not very surprised by that. Yeah, I mean, Konami has like a has like had a weird history. I mean, they not just with Kojima, but like the way they've handled their older franchises, their IP. 
they, it seemed like they were trying to like take the steps towards rectifying that with all the release of the classic collections um and like some new games that they're coming out with they're remaking silent hill 2 and uh snake eater two of their most acclaimed games uh, and this seemed like another step in that direction, but it's like a half step in a way. It would, I think, the best thing that they could do after they remake all these other fucking games. Yeah. Do finish Metal Gear Solid Five. Yeah, that'd be the best thing they could do. Get Kojima back, and just wrap it up. Yeah. Put a nice little bow on it. Anyway. Yeah. Um. Xbox partner live stream. Oh, yeah. There's going to be a Nintendo Direct, but Xbox uh, oh. tomorrow, actually. Microsoft has announced its next gaming showcase. It's coming uh, it's very soon. The Xbox Partner Preview will take place this Wednesday, October 25th, and will we'll provide updates on a variety of games from third-party studios like Ryu, uh, Ga, the, the Like a Dragon team, Remedy, uh, Studio Wildcard, and more. Importantly, though, there will be no news, reveals, or Game Pass announcements pertaining to Microsoft's recent closed deal to acquire Activision Blizzard. Uh, here's everything we know about the partner preview. Um, and it's when one, it is. 1 p.m. Eastern time. 1 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow, October 25th. Uh, okay. It'll show the new Yakuza game, uh, Alan Wake 2 information. Oh, I got crumbs everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It'll be about 20 minutes. Uh, Cool. Yeah. They haven't had a good one. Not since the Ever. one where they rele- revealed uh, Perfect Dark at no. E3. <laughs> Hi-Fi Rush. Oh, that yeah. One. But no, that was also bad, though. That Just Hi-Fi Rush was good in that. But they also showed off Forza in that one, didn't they? And so? I mean, Redfall, but we all know how that turned out. Mm-hmm. No, no, that one was good, no. despite the games that they showed. No, that he- was the best one that they've had ever, but it still wasn't great. <laughs> I like the way that they set that up, where it was just interviews with the developers. Yeah. Because their previous ones were like eight hours long. Yeah. This was a lot better. Yeah. But they ha- didn't fucking have anything good in it, except for High Fry Rush. Well, now, here we know what we're getting. We're getting, uh, we're going to look at Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth, uh, a launch trailer for Alan Wake 2. The first gameplay uh, for Ark Survival Ascend uh, and uh, Dungeons of Hinterburg. Wow. And more. Wow. <laughs> the and more is really carrying that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Alan Wake 2 is the big one. Yeah. So, and Like a Dragon. All right. Last news. Mortal Kombat uh, is is hacking your, your computers. Yeah. This is, again, a strange one. Mortal Kombat 1 has its fair share of surprises, but what you probably didn't know is that the PC version uh, takes a Molina-sized bite out of your hard drive each time it crashes. Unlike the PS5 or Xbox versions of the game, Mortal Kombat 1 on PC wasn't exclusively handled by NetherRealm Studios. Instead, developer QLock was responsible for putting it on PC. The PC version isn't anywhere near the mess of the Switch version, and the PC version uh, QLock developed had... Sorry, and the PC uh, PC developer QLock has a very good record, but it has some issues, which uh, going by the game Steam forums includes the game crashing to desktop. But that's not all. Uh, as reported by several PC players and helpfully compiled by Twitter user X Aziz, each crash apparently leaves a one gigabyte crash file. That's very big. PC gamer PC games often create crashed. Uh, PC games often create crash dumps, so if necessary, players can forward them to the game's developer. They, in turn, can look at the file and figure out what went wrong, but a one gigabyte file? That's a little unusual. On top of that, the game doesn't seem to delete previous crash files, so each crash ties up a gig of hard drive space. If MK1 crashes 20 times, that's 20 gigs of hard drive space or SSD space tied up. As noted in the Steam thread, um, this can get... The uh, players can get the space back by deleting the contents of these two folders, and the folders are listed on screen. Yeah, they should patch in uh, a, a way to delete. Yeah, it's uh, generally not files. a good idea to go around deleting game folders, so uh, you do this at your own risk. But some uh, MK1 PC players uh, have reported getting as much as 60 gigs back. Uh, as spotted by PC Games and a Mortal Kombat community manager has replied to the Twitter thread stating that they've been reported that it's been reported and that, that they know it's a big issue and are working to resolve them as quickly as possible. Just making sure it's done right. 
Yeah, I mean, people are going to be playing that a lot. You yeah, know? It's, like, it's a fighting popular game. game. People like it. It's, so it's going to crash a lot. Yeah. You know? And if happen. people are getting, like, if it's crashing enough that people are getting a 60 gig crash file. Yeah. Like, that, that's ridiculous. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh, all, that's people who are really into the game and playing on shitty computers. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, sh- I haven't heard about how well it, I know it runs pretty bad on the Switch. I haven't yeah. heard about how poorly it runs on I PC. I know Mortal Kombat has actually like had not, has not had good luck on with PC ports. I think they just started getting it right with 11. You know why it seems that way? Because it's Warner Brothers. Yeah. I'm looking, I looked up QLock yeah. on Steam and their other games are games like Gotham Knights. And Injustice, mm. and other and older Mortal Kombat games. Yeah, Dark Souls Remastered. Hmm. Weird. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's what it seems like. Okay. Uh. Anyway, that's it. That's all. all right, now we can do this. Oh. Oh God. I was <laughs> okay. Here we go. Okay. We got this one. Mm-hmm. By creepy.org says Princess Beatrice, the elder daughter of Prince Andrew. And it's her looking weird with <laughs> people taking pictures or like yeah. camera lights flashing. It's very strange. Her eyes are really wide. But it's a quote tweet by Daniel Smith that says, My Furby watching me microwave spoons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, it's funny. Cause she's microwave looks like spoons. a Furby. Yeah. And when you microwave spoons, it makes a lot of lights. That was funny. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. <laughs> now, now we're gonna talk to you. Yes, people. starting with people who have comments over on last week's Wolf Den podcast over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com a slash Wolf Den podcast. Etre says, "Hey, Wolf Bros, I've been watching you guys since 2020, around when I started my first full time job after college. I have now quit that job and I'm looking for a new one." Got any job hunting slash interview advice for me? I know this isn't video game related, but I've been watching you guys for a while and you guys seem like you got a good head on your shoulders and I value what you guys have to say. Uh, hey, man. I'm not not the guy for that. Yeah, I, have, I haven't gone on a job interview in like six years now. So like, I don't fucking remember what the... The last job I interviewed for... Yeah. Uh, the last real job that I interviewed for, uh, I took it as an internship because I was so desperate for a job. Yeah. Uh, and they thought I was overqualified, and I I was like, nobody's hiring me. Please let me do, yeah. do the internship. Uh, <laughs> one thing I will say, and like people have, you know, like talk to experts. They'll they'll say this all the time, but like, do ask questions on your job interview. Yeah, you're interviewing them as much as yeah. they're interviewing. So like. You. Ask them like what a typical day, uh, work day should be, um, what they expect from you uh, within a year, within five years, um, what, cor- and question- what corporate culture is like. Yeah, and specifics about the job you're yeah. applying for. Like if you're if you're doing like a coding thing, you yeah. gotta ask about the language and how mm-hmm. and how you will be getting your projects sent to you and stuff like that. Also, yeah. do a little bit of research on the company itself. Yeah to like try and understand what they're all about so that you have some knowledge going in yeah uh just answer things truthfully and, yeah. and like you would be talking to anybody else and did and, and and the way the way i think about it is like if you can't help if somebody doesn't like you yeah. so like you could walk into an interview and they'll be like oh that guy's got long hair my friggin' ex girlfriend cheated on me with a guy with long yeah. hair i don't like this guy and there's nothing yeah. you could do about that so uh you know, just go in there, act like you would normally act, and if it doesn't happen, doesn't it? It wasn't meant to be. Don't take this advice, but I have heard that mild swearing actually works. It, it, it's, <laughs> some people use that to de-escalate, like like to to make things feel like. Like you're just bros, you know, like, yeah, like, like, like to make it less formal, like not, the, not the big ones, not fucking shit. But like, if you a hell or a damn or a crap, that should be okay. When I took my driver's test. Yeah. The instructor, the, it's a pretty stressful environment. Yeah. This is the, my first driver's test. The instructor is this big fat guy. He got into the, our old yeah. Pontiac. Oh yes. And he, uh, the whole car shifted. He goes, ugh, trying to finish my fucking fries. <laughs> and he threw the fries <laughs> on the dashboard. He goes, all right, pull out. So that was nice. an easy one. I think I said damn in my job interview, and here I am. Damn. 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 
at my last job here's a uh, funny job interview story at my last job uh the bosses went out to interview a new developer uh -huh. and they went like out to like a coffee shop or something uh -huh. and nobody knew that they were bringing that developer back he was some like high profile developer okay um and they walked the boss the two bosses and the the new guy walked in to all of the employees smoking weed <laughs> <laughs> and they were like what the fuck guys yeah. <laughs> so that was fun anyway Timothy says, I love it when AAA games are 50 plus hours personally myself. I mean, some people are into long games. There's not, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there's something to getting the most value out of a game. Yeah. Uh, I like to be involved with uh, all of the games that are coming out. I, I, yeah, yeah. I like when like, everyone's talking about a game and i want to be yeah. a part of that so uh that happens every other week there's a new game to be talking about Especially so this month apparently yeah yeah so when you can get that experience in a very condensed form like yeah. i like that i i'm a big uh context helps me a lot like the context of what's going on in the game uh not necessarily story but like you know what am, what is my character supposed to be doing and if that context ever gets boring or uninteresting then you know i don't really want to spend 50 hours in that universe yeah. you know i want yeah. i'll like back off and stuff so that's that's my stance on games if look if it's great like i'll i'll play the whole 50 hour game the context is there uh melon says do i need to celebrate the one year anniversary of metroid dread before celebrating the two-year anniversary you celebrate the history of the entire franchise before you can celebrate the two-year history of yes metroid dread. no you're know your history yes yeah. backlog brad says xbox doesn't need to pay ubisoft to put activision blizzard king activision blizzard king games on game pass they only need to buy to pay ubisoft to put them on the cloud gaming part of game pass ubisoft has no control over where they put native ga yes yes that should we should have made that yeah we should have made that clear it's, it's all like legalese and very confusing to us peon suburbanites i i erroneously use the term game pass for the cloud gaming part of game yeah. like i i say game pass meaning the cloud gaming version but i really just mean the cloud game yeah. so that's a correction that should be made timothy kelly says the problem to the problem to you bob is there is no th such thing as a good game i hear you say he spelled here wrong say games are bad the Good besides Mario 2D. <laughs> and you know what? 2D Mario came out. And yeah. it's fucking awesome. There you go. So point so, proven. Point proven. What was the last game I, I had? Like uh, Tears of the Kingdom. Yes. I said that was good. I said that was one of the greatest games of all time when yes. that came out. So so fuck you, buddy. <laughs> I also kind of like Starfield. I thought I everyone was oh, really? shitting on that. I thought it was pretty good. Oh wow, yeah. I didn't I didn't hate it. Um have you played Sonic Superstars yet? I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Somebody asked me uh, how Sonic Superstars won. I played it. Uh, it's not good. No. Um, but I kind of like it. Uh, I found myself enjoying trying to get all the Chaos Emeralds. Okay. So it's not terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be enjoyable if you like Sonic, but it is $60 and it is not. It does not deserve to be sixty dollars, okay. especially when Sonic Mania was so cheap. This game is much less than Sonic Mania and a lot shittier than Sonic okay. Mania. So, this is a wait till it's on sale game. Got it. I think it's fine and and it's it's good if you like Sonic, but uh, -huh. uh if you like Sonic, you're willing to put up with a game that is not great. <laughs> Like, it's, I, it's it's I'm dancing around a little bit. Okay. It's not amazing, but okay. but uh I found myself having fun trying to get through the Chaos Emeralds and stuff. Okay. And, and so in this one annoying thing about this game is that uh just like in Sonic 3 you have to find the big rings yeah. to get the Chaos Emeralds. However, um you can only get one Chaos Emerald per world. Okay. So you can't like load up and get them all really early in the game. You Got have it. to get one per world, which is annoying. Yeah. But 
every time you get a Chaos Emerald, you get an, an ability. Right. Uh, Sonic gets he gains an ability mm-hmm. that you can like use a scroll. We you can use like the right thumbstick to activate that ability. And yeah. some of the abilities are kind of cool. Some of them are like super overpowered and right. stupid. Um, but it's fun. To, it was fun to play around with those. I wouldn't say it was sixty dollars fun. Though. Right. Like I'm eventually gonna get it because I've mm-hmm. now committed myself to playing like every mainline Sonic game. And like a 2D Sonic game is usually just something I can like throw up and play regardless of like whether it's Genesis level quality or Sonic 4 quality. Yeah. You know. It's extremely short. Yeah. So. I, I I played for like two and a half hours and I'm on uh world seven mm-hmm. out of eight, I think. Mm-hmm. So or is it seven out of seven? I don't know. But uh yeah, I pl- I I plowed through that. Uh Five, four and a half hours. That's how long it took me to play Mario Wonder when I yeah. speed ran it. Uh, and there's more to Mario Wonder. Yeah, Sonic Superstars is four and a half hours. How long to beat? Yeah. Uh, anyway, we're in the chat. Hello. Okay. Hey, everybody. I thought I hated long games. Recently played AC Origins and Odyssey. Games were long as fuck, but I enjoyed myself. I probably those are like ridiculously long games. I'm gonna try for Spider Man. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna probably play that on the PlayStation Portal when that comes out. Yeah, I would be interested to play that on like remote play. Yeah, you know, because I'm not spending any time with my wife. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> if the kids go to bed, I'm. She texted me. I went to bed after she did. She texted me the next day. She's like, "What time did you go to bed?" I'm like, "After midnight." You went to bed after midnight. I said, "Like you don't understand." I just got the black suit. <laughs> I had to see what happened next. Bob, would you recommend the RG three five XX or the MiU Mini Plus? I have an Odin Pro, but would like to get something to keep in my backpack for work and university. I like the RG three five XX has the RTC clock chip. I don't know what that is, and that the Mini has Wi Fi. Uh, Wi Fi, I find. Mostly useless on those types of Feels devices. Feels like that's overkill. Yeah. Um, the RG35XX has uh, HDMI out, I think. Which I also think is kind of useless because mm-hmm. you got what you got to plug it. It's weird. Yeah. Um, but I do like the RG35XX slightly more. I think the firmware on it is a little better than on the MiU Mini Plus. However, I like the original MiU Mini the best. I think the form factor is so good for just throwing in your backpack. Uh, anyway. I recently got a backbone controller for my iPhone for a PS remote play, and it's sick. I have the USB-C one. Yeah. And I'm hopefully going to get the new iPhone, and I'll plug it into that. I've been checking every day for the new iPhone. Look, yeah. I have the tab open right here <laughs> uh, to see which ones are available near us. Yeah. And they always have the blue one. Hmm. Uh, but I'm I'm trying to hold out for the natural color. I right, want the natural right. color. I, I, I said to wood i was like i've been wanting because he he got one right right uh he ordered it and waited for it to ship i was like i've been checking every day uh i could get the blue one but i'm not a fucking loser (laughs) and then he goes i have the blue one of course he did of course he did (laughs) i was like oh no i didn't know that until you got the natural uh bob did you see new york is trying to make it so you need a background check for to buy 3d printers yes will said said that to me yeah uh, since people have the potential to print guns with one, they still need to. Bu- Who would ever do that? <laughs> they still need to buy metal parts. Yeah, I know. So yeah. I'm not going to explain how they do that, but I I know how they do that. It's pretty complicated. Um, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's it's yeah. It's I rid- don't th- I don't think that's going to pass. No, that's a ridiculous like yeah. o- o- overkill. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where you know a politician heard that you could do something with it. So now everyone has to suffer yeah. for it. I don't think that's going to pass. I think, you know, it'll just get, you know, cooler heads will prevail and it'll just get thrown out or whatever. I, I've seen, uh, I think it was Vice did a whole thing on 3D printed guns. And yeah. uh, y- if you're lucky, you can get one shot. Exactly. Off, yeah. And that's that's it because the whole thing just falls apart. It's You can't 
3D print a, a gun. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. I mean, you could if you make them for my action figures, like you have done. Yeah, yeah. And so I have... he, he sent one of the first things I ever printed on this 3D printer was literally a gun, <laughs> but it was literally it was fucking this big. That I found uh, free because S- they don't come with that with yeah, guns with anymore. Parts. Yeah. Well, no, the DC ones don't. But right. I found now uh, ones, ones for my for GI, GI Joes, Joes that I need you to. 3d print eventually See that, but that's the thing is yeah. that i could just take that file and go whoop and then yeah. i have a i have a gun yeah you have a full m14 <laughs> uh fun uh anyway people were mad i and gave starfield a seven but like there were issues it's like cyberpunk where people were afraid to say it had problems uh i i don't envy these publications who have to who have a lot of eyeballs on them and they have to review something before anybody else reviews it because because everybody is going to make up their minds about something and you don't know what it is before you put the thing out and you don't have like the obscurity that like i have where i can be like i don't care what anybody else says this thing's stupid you are like gonna be pretty up there on metacritic and if you give it a low score and everybody else is giving it a high score you're the one guy that's ruining the score yeah you know that that's a weird situation to be in we live in a world where like putting a number at the end of a review score at the end of a review like games evolve over time Mm -hmm. like a game like starfield now is not going to be the same Starfield you play in a year from now yeah and i think you know, publications have experimented with updating review scores. Like IGN's uh, has updated their review score for games like Fortnite and Minecraft um, that are different from when they launched No Man's Sky. But I think as a whole, publications that do put uh, numbers at the end of their review don't do a good job of updating them as the games get better. I, I think um, they tried... I, I think IGN came out a few years ago and said we're going to change the way we do review scores because games are evolving. But yeah. I think that announcement was about how if a game's not finished when it launches, they're not going to review it. I think that was when it, if a game's not finished, they're going to wait to review it. Yeah. Like they're going to do a review in progress or something. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, which is a good idea yeah but at the same time you're still gonna give it a number yeah. by the end of that and you're not gonna update it in a year's time when I, the game is actually at its best state i talk about rainbow six a lot because when yeah. that came out it was bad mm-hmm. and then it got better later and yeah. and became a huge success but that review score is still up there you yeah. know of the bad version of the game yeah. so they, they should start changing stuff yeah um I gamer mean, lady look, what i was gonna say look at cyberpunk you know, like yeah the journey that's been on gamer lady in the chat said breaking news amber nick is announcing a new handheld and is and the article names wolf den twice they threw it in the discord this is inverse uh uh search for handheld on youtube and you'll get a million results for handheld pcs like steam deck Game Boy mods and amber nick what the heck is Ambernick? Tacky Udon or Wolfden subscribers don't need an introduction. <laughs> but for the uninitiated, Ambernick is a company that specializes in pumping seriously crack cranking out handhelds capable of emulating old game systems. It took me about seven minutes into a Wolfden video before I purchased the Game Boy esque RG three five XX. God damn it, I'm selling all these fucking consoles. <laughs> uh Ambernick's new handheld, the RG Arc changes things up from the Game Boy aesthetic to a form factor that's Sega Saturn inspired. And you know what? Even as somebody who preferred Super Mario over Sonic, I'm very here for it. The handheld connoisseurs over at Retro Dodo, they're naming everybody, Yeah, have the lowdown on the arc. Here's the Embernick arc. I'm playing their YouTube video. It's just a, f- it's just another one of these things. <laughs> it just has the buttons of a sega console i mean to be fair they all have the buttons of a super nintendo yeah so 
this will make it easy if you're really a Sega kid. This will make it easier for you to play your Sega game. I'm sure RGT is losing his goddamn mind <laughs> over this. Uh, and M- famed emulation YouTube, the king of emulation is what is yeah. what he's known as. <laughs> RGT85. Uh, I kind of do like the smoky black one. Though. The smoky black one looks yeah. kind of cool. So is this going to play Sega Saturn games good? Because none of these play Sega Saturn games good. Yeah. Uh, it says it could play Dreamcast games good. Okay. Okay. We're we're doing something. Yeah. But the Dreamcast used the SNES style button layout. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like a Sega Saturn controller. But okay. what's Do we know what processor it has? Uh, oh, it's gonna be Android. Uh huh. Um, no, it doesn't say what processor. Um, a lot of these things are usually based off of other ones. Uh huh. Uh, so I'd be interested. I I want to know what it's gonna what how powerful it's gonna be. Yeah. Because uh oh, it's Android and Linux. It's like what the one I gave you. It does. It can do. Yeah. Both. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm interested to see if it's going to play Saturn good at all, because none of them do. Yeah. Saturn, notoriously hard to emulate. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway. Oh, so here, CPU. Uh, looks like an RK3566 Core 64 gig Cortex A55. Main frequency, 1.8 gigahertz. <clears throat> Is that a good one? <laughs> <laughs> I I got no fucking idea. Uh rock chip. It is a chip capable this is the the Retro Dodo article. It is a chip capable uh that can run everything up to N64, DS, PS1, PSP, Dreamcast and even Saturn. It will do a bit of PS2 and GameCube but not very well. Definitely do not buy uh this device um in hopes of playing a lot of those games. Do they mention any other devices that have the same chip? No. Okay. Oh, I, I, I see it. Rock chip RK. Uh, emulator. Anbernick? Anbernick. Both models come with Bluetooth for external controllers and Wi-Fi for game scraping and online functionality on Android. RG353M, I think, uses the same chip. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I have that one. Believe it or not. Yeah, I don't remember this one. I have the 350M. So I don't know. I I don't I don't know. I'll, I'll have to look at a okay. video from like Retro Game Core or Tacky Udon to see if he has one of these. Uh. I just want to make sure Burning Rangers runs good. It's yeah. the only Sega Saturn game that I care about. Even the Ein Odin, which is, it was the most powerful handheld emulator for a long time. Yeah. That did not do Sega Saturn good. Right. So I doubt that this would too. Anyway, uh, let me thank a couple of subscribers before we leave. Uh, uh, we didn't thank anybody uh mikey <laughs> two times thanks for the 13 months i'm dealing with this mess of a monitor versus tv shit right now all right you mean you're dealing with it also or you're dealing with us explain explaining yourself it. yeah uh akela crossing thank you for the seven months blackbird thank you for the 22 months ice chick thank you for the prime and jim jimbo the jerk thanks for the two months wolf pack for life hello Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolfden Podcast is every Tuesday night on 8 p.m. at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash Wolfden. If you can't make the show for any reason at all, we always put it up as an archive version over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolfden Podcast. So you can go and check us out over there on demand whenever you want. But if you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us, you can do that as well. Because we're also an audio podcast on every single podcast service of choice. But no matter where you get the show from, folks, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all of those respective platforms. Uh, this just in, Cooter Looter in the chat says, okay. I just got an ad that Amaranth now has jerk, now is now on Jerkmates. Did we cover this on the news? Uh, no. 
That was not in any of the websites I went to. This also, week. was it in? Did you get an ad on Twitch, or were it, was it in one of your other tabs? You sick fuck. <laughs> um. All right, that's it. We're done. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm gonna raid Geo the Hero. He is playing Sonic Superstars, <laughs> and I don't remember this part. This might be the end of the game. <laughs> <laughs> So if you don't want spoilers, uh, don't join the raid. But here you go. Check it out. Uh, I'll see you probably Thursday for more Mario Wonder. Uh, maybe tomorrow. I don't know. I do want to play the game a lot because I'm having a lot of fun with it. And uh, I want to 100% it, but I also want to speed run it some more. So uh, we'll see. Thanks for being here. We'll see you later. Goodbye. Bye.